uh, dear uh, international guests, dear friends, it is a great pleasure and a great honor uh, to welcome you uh, all to our annual flagship ship conference. The title of this year's event is Defending Liberal Democracy Around the World. Why did we choose this title? Why do we call for a defense of liberal democracy? Interestingly, at least rhetorically, most states around the globe want to be recognized as democracies. Take, oddly, Russia. According to the, its constitution, Russia is a democratic, federal, law-bound state. In reality, we know that this could not be further from the truth. What the Russian, Russian regime really thinks of democratic values became clear long before its brutal and shameful aggression against Ukraine. And Russia is not alone. Turkey is, per, in, its, uh, in its constitution, a secular and democratic uh, republic. And I could go to the most extreme example and look at North Korea, whose official name is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. How life looks like in these countries I don't need to tell you, ladies and gentlemen. The thing is that not every political system which calls itself a democracy is one. And even more important, not every democracy is a liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is a form of democracy in which the government of, uh, the power of the government is limited and the freedom and the rights of individuals are protected and respected. This is what we must defend, and this is what is under threat. Under threat from two sides. From within, it is anti-liberal movements that are spreading in Europe, and in North America, where it was long thought that liberal democracy was absolutely securely established. The possibility of a Trump presidency in 2024 and the growing strength of right-wing populist parties like here in Germany, think of our last state elections uh, on this uh, weekend, are symptoms of this. From outside, liberal democracy is challenged by actors whose values are diametrically opposed to ours. Russia and China confidently advocate their concepts of modern authoritarianism as a genuine countermodel, as they understand it, a countermodel to liberal democracy, and do not reframe from brute violence to impose it, as we see in Ukraine. Also, non-state actors, like terrorist groups, are a threat to liberal democracy, oftentimes assisted by authoritarian regimes like Iran. They try to destabilize open societies and do not shy away from targeting innocent people as we have cruelly witnessed last weekend in Israel. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, allow me at this point to direct a few words to our Israeli friends. Liberals around the world stand in solidarity with Israel. We condemn the horrible attacks and atrocities against civilians and support Israel's right to defend itself against this unprecedented attacks, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> 
As liberals, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot stand idly by when our values are being threatened, whether from the outside or from within. It is therefore the core task of our lifetime to protect and to promote liberal democracy. It is not a choice we can take. It is our responsibility. The EU, as a beacon for the values of liberal democracy, has a special role to play in this endeavor. In the EU, we have witnessed the transformative power of liberal democracy in shaping our continent's course, but we should not take that for granted. Liberal democracy is not a finished product, but an ongoing journey one that the EU must champion at home and abroad. Hence, the EU's response to the historical challenge must be twofold. First, within our union, we must fortify the foundations of our democratic principles. It is upon us to protect the rule of law in every country, ensure the independence of our institutions, promote human rights, and nurture a vibrant civil society. These are the cornerstones of our democratic existence. This is why we cannot allow so-called illiberal democracies in our midst to take hold. Second, in the face of outside attacks against liberal democracy, we must be unwavering in our response. In the spirit of the great liberal Ralf Dahrendorf, we must recognize that the defense of liberal democracy everywhere is in our own interest. Thus, the EU stands against actions that threaten liberal democracy, whether in Ukraine or elsewhere uh, in the world, must be steadfast and must be resolute. It is clear that defending liberal democracy is not a passive endeavor, but an active commitment, one that requires stamina, as we have learned in the last few years up to the very recent uh, present, uh, even up to today. Let us embrace this mission with determination for the defense of liberal democracy is not just a political imperative, it is our moral obligation to future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, in this spirit, I wish us all a great inspiring conference today here, just a few steps uh, from the German style symbol of freedom, uh, the Brandenburg Gate. In this wonderful surroundings. I'm very happy to see you all here to discuss with you uh, uh, today. Thank you very much for your attention, and we now continue in the program. Thanks very much. Many thanks. Many thanks to you, Dr. Paquet, for those very inspiring words. And good morning, excellencies, dear guests. Also for me, a very warm welcome to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation's conference, Reshape Europe. I'm Melinda Crane, and it will be my very great pleasure and honor to accompany you today as moderator. A quick word on translation before we begin. We do have headsets available in case some members of the audience wish to have simultaneous translation but do not yet have a device. You will find those headsets here at the back of the room. Ganz kurz auch nochmal in Deutsch. Falls Sie sich eine Übersetzung wünschen und noch kein Gerät dafür haben, Sie finden uh, Dolmetschergeräte hier hinten im Raum neben der Garderobe. As we just heard from Dr. Paquet, the aim of this conference is to talk about how Europe should reposition itself in the face of manifold challenges to the model of freedom and democracy that so many of us have viewed as an irresistible beacon until now. 
from new geopolitical rivalry to wars of aggression to disinformation and polarization, international and domestic threats are calling into question many of the foundational values associated with the European project. Over the course of the day, we will hear keynotes outlining some of these challenges. Two high-ranking panels, one this morning and one this afternoon, will pick up on those keynote messages and discuss how to find the right balance between liberal European values and European cohesion, between reinforcing democracy and freedom while simultaneously fostering a stronger role for Europe in the world. We're also eager for your assessment, dear guests. We look forward to your participation later on in the final phase of a worldwide hackathon that will reach its conclusion here today and that spotlights Europe's role on the global stage. And I'll tell you more about how you can participate later on, just before lunch. Now, let us get started. We had hoped to begin this part of the program with a message from the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, but unfortunately his office was compelled to decline at relatively short notice due to the approach of the winter heating season and the need to restore critical infrastructure that has been destroyed by the Russian attacks. The mayor sends his warm greetings and we apologize for the omission. We're all the more proud to have with us Ukraine's ambassador to Germany, His Excellency Oleksiy Makayev. His keynote serves as a reminder that Ukrainians are fighting valiantly for our common European values. Welcome, Excellency. You have the floor. Dear Dr. Packe, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, I would say we are witnessing the uh, rebirth of Europe, another rebirth of Europe. The reinvention of its social consensus and its social political senses. This ability f to find itself again and again may actually be a European defining feature. Reshapingness maybe European superpower. Indeed, Europe is being revisited and reconceptualized. It happened many times before, also within the newest history. Just imagine Europe in 1945, 68, 89, and today. Those are four absolutely different worlds. Social political senses change as Europeans make history. Borders of the Union follow the borders of ideas. The geographical self-vision of Europe changes. Europe goes east. A uh, Ukrainian uh, politologist and philosopher, Henrik Libovitsky, uses the metaphor of Berlin's wall to describe that undrawn line of Europe the gap between civilizations, the moving border of Europe, eastern border of freedom and democracy. Russian mining fields on our occupied territories today, which might be up to 20 kilometers broad, those are de facto and new today's Berlin Wall. And it is our goal to overcome this barrier, to liberate people from occupation. This time, breaking the wall means winning the war, because this time, Europe, European values, there were, and Europeans were attacked. Not the 24th February of 2022 uh, has to become the watershed date of European history. On the contrary, it has to be the victory date, the day that once again states freedom worth fighting, is worth fighting for. I 
really appreciate the idea uh, of uh, the new Europe from Lisbon to Luhansk. Last week, uh, it was uh, presented by uh, Minister uh, Annalena Baerbock. Um, this vision is tomorrow's Europe we build and partially rebuild, but this time we have to liberate whole of future Europe. Eastern enlargement happens. First, the enlargement, uh, the enlargement of the mindset. Next, to the enlargement of the Union. Implementation of this vision, its practical realization, has to become our common goal and our common sense. The united European effort and the united European success. It means liberating the territories in order to liberate the people. Returning freedom as a value, universal value. Returning respect to human rights. I can very well recall the joint appeal of the civil society of Ukraine to the European Union to grant Ukraine the candidate status. In the same appeal, they promised to, beco to become watchdogs of the reform progress after. Today, I again thank Europe for that historical decision. And I thank our Ukrainian civil society for heartily fulfilling their watchdog promises. It's not a secret that Ukraine's goal without, uh, within the Eastern Partnership is the European Union membership. We have made progress on all seven Commission's recommendations. As the head of Bundestag uh, EU uh, Committee, Anton Hofreiter, rightfully framed this as conditions. We considered the interim assessment and we are confidently moving towards the final positive assessment in October. And we expect the Council decision to start accession negotiations with Ukraine. Yes, we are fully aware there are no fast tracks, and we are not searching any kind of free pass to the European Union. Ethical values are fundamental of the European Union, Bricks of this building are legal and economical regulation, though. We are doing our technical homework to get what we have morally deserved and for what we have been fighting since the very first Orange Revolution back in 2004 uh, and then Revolution of Dignity 2013. 32 years ago, we Ukrainian made a choice a choice between freedom and tyranny, between future and the past, between truth and lies. And, but our independence is not one-time declaration and is not a present, but rather an ongoing process. It's not enough to make cho uh, the choice once. You make it every day, again and again. And today, Ukraine is fighting for its choice of life, the choice to live. Our defensive battle continues. Our soldiers liberate our country and our people. Our boys and girls are fighting for European peace, for peace here in Europe. We're not alone in this fight. The democratic world stands with us, in solidarity with us, and support us. Europe support our choice, and thus new Europe is being born once again with Ukraine as the gate of this new Europe. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, Ambassador. You may stay with me. You may stay right with me on stage because we will move straight into our panel with just a very short detour on the way to see a brief film that reminds us what it is that we're fighting for. And in that time, let me ask the other panelists to please join me here on stage. So, Ambassador, that will be your seat. Do we have the film? It can look like this. Or like this. It is threatened. But it is our responsibility to protect it. 
For each person, it means something different. But when we reach it, we all know what it looks like, what it sounds like, or how it feels. And if we all fight for it, it will eventually bring us together. Freedom. Thank you very much. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our panel for this first discussion. And I begin here with uh, the lady seated next to the ambassador. Vera Hobhouse is a member of the UK Parliament representing Bath. And she serves as the Liberal Democrats shadow leader in the House of Commons, as well as the Liberal Dems, Dems spokesperson for energy, climate change, and transport. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Seated next to her is Marta Lempart. She is a women's rights activist and founder of the civic women's rights movement, All Poland Women's Strike, which campaigns for better health care and abortion access, as well as equal rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Welcome. Great to have you here. And I'm very pleased to introduce Raza Nedelkov. He is program director at the Belgrade-based Center for Research, Transparency, and Accountability, CRTA, which is a recipient of the OSCE's Democracy Defender Award for its work promoting democracy and civic activism in Serbia. Welcome to you. And finally, we are very, very grateful that Maria Agnes Strack-Zimmermann has joined us this morning, given all that you have on your agenda at the moment. Uh, it's a great honor to have you with us. She is a member of the German parliament and also chairs its defense committee. And she's the FDP's designated Spitzenkandidaten, its lead candidate for next year's European elections. Our discussion is entitled Defending European Values at Home and Abroad. And over the next hour, we want to explore both internal and external challenges to European values and discuss their implications for the role of the EU and its value partners. And just a very quick reminder to our speakers, we have a lot of really interesting, important material and a compact window of time, so I'm awfully grateful for brief answers, if you would, meaning in this first round of discussion, if you can manage it under two minutes, because we're going to have a chance to come back to many of our topics. And this panel is meant to be concentrated mostly on issues relating to the European neighborhood. However, in light of the current events, it's impossible to begin without at least a word on Israel. And my initial question was going to be to ask all of you, in the face of the turbulence that we're seeing both internal and external, uh, Russian aggression, uh, Islamist terrorism, expansion of Chinese influence, encroaching populism, and rising polarization, what worries you the most? But I think I hardly have to ask uh, MP Strack-Zimmermann, because I've seen your tweets in the night uh, around, I think, 12.30, 1 o'clock. You were tweeting about what Europe needs to do in relation to uh, the attack on Israel. So perhaps a very brief word on that concern and how it relates to Europe's role, if you would, before we return to our, our European topic. Um, okay, thank you very much. And sorry, a little bit too late, but uh, it's um, yeah, strange moments uh, now for one and a half year, and uh, it's really special. So. Um, Yes, uh, you know, the question is, if we have in Europe, we have values, but are we ready to fight for these values? I mean, it's not easy, 27 um, different countries and interests, but I think this is a huge question. And to talk just, to say just two sentences to Israel, 1,000 people, 1,000 people are dead, 2,500 are wounded, 
100 are carried off wherever 70, 50, 750 are missing in two days. This is absolutely unbelievable what happens in Israel. And it's not the question to, in the morning a journalist asked me, oh, do we have to send now weapons to Israel? That's not the question. There is a strong army. They need our support in our heart, in our words, and in, in the UN and all over to help Israel. And even, and you will see the pictures in the future, Israel has to react, react of course. And um, I'm not sure if our society, if is Europe society ready to, to, yeah, how could I say, to stand to Israel also in a few weeks? Mm -hmm. This is a big question. So long-term support. Thank you. So really long-term support, yes. And they need our help. And it's a tragedy that for Jewish people in this moment, it's safer to live not in Israel. It's really terrible. Thank you very much. Let me now go across the panel to ask each of you to talk a little bit about what are the threats that worry you most at the moment, looking at your own country, looking at Europe as a whole, internal threats, external threats, a mix of both. And I'll start here uh, with Raza Nadezhov. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be on this kind of a panel and uh, opportunity to speak uh, to you. I would say uh, Serbia as a young democracy for us, any kind of destabilization in the world and populism, rise of populism uh, that was mentioned in the, in the keynotes speaking is a huge threat for us. As a fragile democracy with institutions extremely weak, right now we have only one basically institution, institution of president of Serbia uh, that is thriving in his, uh, I would say, spin dictatorship, a new era type of dictatorship with the media being completely captured, opposition completely uh, uh, scattered and weak, institutions uh, uh, invisible. And in this kind of environment, everything that means that we are losing role models for, for Serbia or at least for democracy defenders such as I am and uh, similar organizations, countries of political West, liberal democracies were the role models for us we were looking at you as a success stories, as a goals for us as well. And when we are looking that you are falling down, hopefully getting up, this is everything which means a lot of worry, worry for us. Serbia and Western Balkans is in, is in continuous instability. I would say that we are all captured by the corrupted political elites with citizens being extremely weak. And uh, the, the happenings um, uh, in recent from a couple of days ago, and especially with the full-fledged invasion of Russia in Ukraine, is just one of the, uh, in the role of the, of the excuses for the local politicians to, to take it as their own uh, way on mm -hmm. securing their autocracy. Thank you very much. Marta? It's on. OK. Uh, the, the answer will be much, much different than it would be like two years ago. Uh, for me now, with all that is happening in Poland and elsewhere, uh, still the biggest threat is um, the Western ignorance to the biggest I told you so that we've had in Europe for many years. So the fact that Russia is a monstros monstrosity and that Russia will never stop in their attempt to colonize, to kill, to rape, to loot all their neighbors. So we have European uh, elections coming. And I hear an offer from European politicians from the European community on reforming the union, on helping us with judicial independence, with the rule of law, with gender uh, equality. We will manage. We will manage. That's not of interest for us now, in, in Poland, in Latvia, in Lithuania. We will manage with everything that comes our way, but we won't manage without the Western institutions, politicians, the European community realizing that we are still alive, that we, are, uh, we wake up in our beds alive because Ukrainian army stands between us and the Russians. 
That's our reality. This is the resentment basket from Poland, from Latvia, from Lithuania. This is the fact that I would say two years ago that I'm European, and now I'm saying that I'm from the East. We have to acknowledge, you have to acknowledge, that we have the West and the East in Europe, and that's fine. And our experiences are different, and our fears are different. And if it's not acknowledged, in European elections, in the countries that have the highest possible support to being in the EU, like Poland, we will have the lowest turnout, because we won't get the answer to the question, when will Ukraine join? What's the path for Ukraine? How will you tra treat Ukraine? Everybody will, everybody will be watching how Ukraine is treated, because there is the resentment basket from us joining also. Mm -hmm. If we won't get the answers to those questions, what about Russia and what about Ukraine, nothing will be interesting for us about these elections. There will be no interest in voting in European elections if we won't get that answer, if we will be talking about European values in general, rule of law, gender equality, and so on. The things that are so dear to my heart, the things that are so dear for us that we put our lives on the line, still the situation is changed so badly that I'm desperately afraid that if it lasts, this ignoring this eastern part and the fact that we d need different things in the upcoming European elections, we will have the lowest turnout, the lowest number of people voting in Poland, mm -hmm. in Latvia, in Lithuania, all countries that are in the direct danger from Russia, ever, mm -hmm. in the most enthusiastic European countries. That's, that's the thing that will happen. Marta Lempart, thank you very much. And let me go to Vera Hophaus. Well, thank you very much. Um, I would say two things worry me most, um, and that is the breakdown of solidarity between countries that are supposed to share values, um, and that every country is going back into its own little zone, um, and, and the result of that is ultimately um, nation states that, have, that fight wars with each other. So it continues to be so important that liberal democracies stand together cross-border, and therefore we have the European Union, and that this solidarity is not just an institutional solidarity, but I think, as, as you refer to, that the people really believe that, because otherwise the European Union is a bit of an empty shell. People should really understand why the European Union, what the European Union is for, and that there was a big misunderstanding. The UK is the biggest example of that. They didn't know why actually the UK was in the European Union. And that is still a tragedy. And the biggest tragedy is that the people didn't understand that. And my second worry um, is, is, is also an understanding of the people. Yeah? And we are a liberal democracy because we believe in people and we trust in people. But we need the people with us. And if people don't understand what democracies are for and why we actually fight for them, then we are in big trouble. People don't understand what is actually democracy for. Why do we protect minorities? Why do we have free and fair elections? Why is all of that so important? And if we lose people knowing this and believing in it, then we lose liberal democracies altogether. That's my biggest worry. Thank you very much. And I've, I've heard uh, MP Strack Zimmermann nodding and uh, saying yes under her breath to several of the points that have been made, both the point about Russia as, uh, as an ongoing and very dire threat, as well as the issue of European solidarity. So say a word on those two points, if you would, before we switch to internal challenges. No, it, it, it's just... This is a problem. We have, you know, the circumstances are so complicated. And um, you have to explain people all these things. But the, 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 the problem is um, the most people don't read newspaper anymore. They have their iPhone and small messages, one sentence, maybe two sentences, and that's it. And to explain the, the situation of Europe, the situation in your country, ev everything belongs to, to uh, each other. Um, and this is, yes, this is a fact. And we have to, um, we need a restart, maybe in school, maybe also in, in, really, you have to start really early, 
I know when I talk to my children, okay, my grandchild, uh, child, uh, child, uh, uh, grandchildren are too small, but when I talk to my children, I, I try to explain um, how could, yes, the, the future of our continent. And we have to realize that this Europe um, must survive also without help, for example, for the United States. This is really a job we have to do, in friendship, of course, to the United States. But you have, we have to realize that the future is only just in a positive way if we realize that we have to do our job. And second sentence, we need um, uh, you know, one um, foreign policy. Now in Europe, every, everybody is looking um, you know, not out of their own box. And this is a real problem. We are one continent, we, have, we want to live in freedom, in peace, and this is a job we have to do. Thank you very much. I'd like to talk now a bit about internal challenges and also about uh, some of the points that have been made uh, about uh, the EU accession process as a way to help support countries moving toward values of democracy and freedom. So let me go back to Ambassador Makayev now. And we heard a very passionate plea there from Marta Lempart for EU membership for Ukraine sooner rather than later. As Ukraine seeks that membership, what are the key areas where you believe that EU support could be most in fact impactful in advancing democratic and institu democratic institutions and values. Thank you. <clears throat> you know what happened after uh, 24th of February uh, 2014 uh, is that uh, Europeans uh, stopped uh, challenging themselves uh, about what European solidarity means. Uh, is that solidarity between institution uh, and the people, between the countries uh, and, and the nations. And we have seen uh, Ukrainian flags uh, everywhere in Europe uh, since February last year. And the whole Europe uh, realized that actually European solidarity is solidarity with Ukrainians <clears throat> who are fighting for, for their lives. I think that Europeans also realized that uh, we are used to uh, to live comfortably under those great European values, sometimes uh, going to protect those values, but never fighting for those values. And this is something which encourages now also Europeans that those who are fighting for it need to be protected. And what I, uh, what I see changing today in Europe is the basic assumption that helping Ukraine to win this war uh, shall be in the interest of Europe, of Europeans, and the national interest of all the countries. And this is why the whole process of EU accession is not something which is used to be uh, before, like uh, giving a certain uh, uh, um, uh, benchmarks uh, for the countries to fulfill and waiting and sitting whether the country would be able to uh, to accomplish the uh, the goals uh, uh, on time but rather taking ukraine by the hand and saying we take you to to the european union we will go this uh, way together so this basic assumption is crucial for ukraine to implement all uh, those uh, challenges and to implement all those conditions which are uh, being set, and this is not, some, not something uh, to, to un underestimate. Thank you for that. Can you tell us your assessment as you look at the internal challenges uh, in Ukraine about where the country stands today on human rights, on rule of law, on democracy, on corruption? Um, well, last word is uh, is something which is uh, which I'm uh, being asked uh, every every now and then. Um, you have to realize that uh, major shifts are happening also in Ukrainian society, and just imagine uh, on, on on corruption. Uh, well, it it belongs to to the every morning routine of Ukrainians 
uh, waking up in the middle of the night uh, because of the air, air raid siren, uh, listening or going down to the shelter, listening to, uh, to the work of uh, the, uh, the air defense, uh, shutting down Russian rockets uh, and uh, Russian drones, then waking up uh, uh, late, uh, uh, looking in the telephone, short messages, everything is fine or not, checking with, uh, with the relatives whether they are alive or not, and then uh, donating to the Ukrainian uh, armed forces. And just imagine, after this morning routine, would it be somehow acceptable for Ukrainians that somebody from, from the state servants, uh, civil servants, uh, would be bribed uh, and uh, uh, involved in the corruption. So we have a zero tolerance of corruption in the society, and this would help us, the government, with our established institutions to eradicate corruption uh, in Ukraine. And, you know, human rights, well, that's, that's what we are fighting for. And that's what we, uh, we listen to, what is happening in the occupied territories uh, with, uh, with Ukrainians taking hostages with Ukrainian children uh, abducted uh, to Russia uh, and, and drawing those parallels to, to Israel today. Well, this is a nightmare. The people in the hands of terrorists uh, are uh, experiencing right now. And, and this is why we need to, uh, to fight back to, uh, to free our people and to reestablish uh, this democracy and, uh, and human rights uh, in, the, in the occupied territories. And I want to come back, thank you. I want to come back a bit later to the accession uh, issues and Eastern neighborhood issues, but I'd like to now uh, turn toward a focus on internal challenges uh, and starting perhaps uh, with Poland and Serbia, if I may. And uh, Marta Lempart, Poland's government has, of course, faced a great deal of criticism for undermining the rule of law and democratic principles in the country. You told us your answer would have been different two years ago than it is now, and certainly those are issues that you have put the spotlight on. How do they impact the daily lives of, of citizens in Poland? Um, the, the breaking of the rule of law and judicial independence in Poland, uh, we can look at three levels, basically. So we can look at the top level and the fact that the political powers hijack the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court. And hijacking Constitutional Court means, among others, ban on abortion. By, uh, by persons who are not even legally appointed judges, but also, it also means dropping different international conventions and also declaring uncon as, as unconstitutional some parts of the European treaties. It already happened with the right to fair trial with the parts of the treaties. So there is this constitutional court that drops and will be dropping one by one different conventions, Istanbul Convention, Persons with Disabilities Rights Convention, um, um, Human Traffic, and so on, so on. All the international obligations that protect human rights will be and are being now, as, I'm, as, as we speak, there are motions filed in the so-called constitutional court and they are being dropped by the Polish government, by this court. The second thing is the Supreme Court, when the illegally established chamber uh, will decide about validity about, um, of elections next week. The persons who are not judges, they are not Supreme Court judges, they will be deciding about voting protests and the validity of the election. So this is the top level. The middle level is persons going to court. Uh, our laws on judiciary didn't change just once, so it's not about bringing them back. It's about 18 changes and, and so much chaos. So now you can imagine that there are rulings by the courts that nobody knows if they are valid, nobody knows if they will stay, nobody knows if they are worth something because they are, they are being done and they are being um, uh, preceded by the non-judges, by the by judges who are not legally uh, appointed or they are not legally promoted to the positions that, that they are at. So this is the second level. And the third level is activists like me. I'm on 115 trials for protesting. And the fact, the resistance, the incredible resistance of Polish judges, because we're talking about thousands and thousands, not just the top ones, thousands of Polish judges, but us all about three years. And the fact that the European Court of Justice is the only EU institution that decided to actually react to what's happening in Poland. 
So we had three years, but we have elections coming, and if, uh, maybe I will not talk about elections, but No, yes, judicial. please, tell us just okay. in one so word. So my, my, my court date, like the next court date that I have, because now m magically I don't have any court dates for uh, September or August, or everything disappeared, everything is delayed. So I have my court date on Monday after the elections at 10. It's the court case uh, when it's up to five years with the military persecution for uh, saying that our Polish border guards are killing people at the Belarusian border, which they are doing. Uh, so everybody's waiting for the outcome of the elections because this is a neo-judge, it's not a legal judge on that trial. And since the European Commission, uh, a year and a half ago, decided to give up on the rule of law in Poland and they gave Polish government the green light to do whatever they want, we see that with legal judges being removed from all the political cases, all activist cases, and the non-legal judges being established. So I have judges removed in my cases, and I have non-legal judges established. And of course, we're filing motions about, uh, against that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But this is the closest as it gets. So we're talking about a couple of thousands of activists who are being charged, who are on trials for protesting, who were protected because we had independent judges in independent judiciary, and now it's coming to a close. That's actually now these elections will decide because we know that if this government will win the elections, the European Commission will give up on us totally. So they will let them close the system totally, remove all the legal judges and establish the non-legal ones. That's what's what will your, happen. In a word, what's your assessment? Will peace win? It's 50-50. We, we don't know. We, uh, opposition needs another million votes. Like they have to win and then they need another million votes to cover half a million votes that will be stolen from people voting abroad because of the system and the law that was imposed. And half a million for, for people voting in closed institutions, uh, elderly homes, prisons, because the government doesn't even pretend. It's 100% okay. for the government. So we're behind one million votes before the elections already started. So that's the challenge that we're dealing with. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to ta ask you to talk later about how the EU uh, can respond to that challenge. But let me go now to Razin Dedekov. Um, and your center, a recent study, has shown that the main sources of disinformation in Serbia are public officials and government media. Government media, public officials. How do you perceive the current state of democracy in Serbia, especially in relation to rule of law uh, and, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, a, a citizens' ability to get the information they need to be participating uh, fully? I already mentioned in, a, in an introductory uh, uh, point that Serbia is a fragile democracy with institutions only with the facades, quite nice one. Citizens who are deeply uh, victimized uh, by the media, and we mentioned government media is basically the mainstream media in Serbia. We are talking about the TV stations that are still the number one source of information for average Serbian citizen together with online media owned by the same media outlets, basically is all controlled by the government. And uh, internally, these media are source of non-democracy. They are uh, presenting um, um, local um, different political elites from the position as negative uh, uh, actors, and of course, the governmental uh, actors as the, the mostly positive. And uh, just as a a number that could illustrate the state of the media and how Serbian citizens are victims of those media is the fact that, for example, one political leader, leader uh, uh, of the biggest political party, member of the EPP, addressed the nation in 2022, live in camera, 300 times, average 45 minutes. 300 times the president of Serbia addressed the nation. In 2023, we are uh, in October, it's more than 210 times. 95% of all interlocutors in central news, which are being watched by approximately 70% of people on a daily basis, 95% goes to one political group. So when we are being asked, why Serbian citizens are not supporting the whole Europe when the war in Ukraine uh, uh, started? Why we are not standing with Ukrainians? Well, because they are exposed on a daily basis with propaganda. 
Bucha did not happen for Serbian citizens. Russia is denazifying Ukraine. These are the answers that we got from Serbian citizens in public opinion poll. And when you analyze the narratives in our media, it's because what's being said to them. So the ability for them to analyze a, a situation from different sources is practically impossible. Uh, because everybody to whom they believe, from political elites that are available in the media or the media themselves, they are selling the, uh, uh, the manipulation uh, with, with the information. And there is one catch in all of this. There is a not that fun, but appealing fact. What do you think is the percentage of Russian companies advertising in Serbian media that are spreading anti-Western, anti-European, pro-Russian, pro-Chinese propaganda. I bet that you would say 10, 20, 50, 17 percent because we are, as a, a, a governmental structure, so pro-Russian. It's 0 0.1. 63 percent goes to European companies. Number one advertiser in Serbia is German company Lidl. The same company that advertises in the program where Frau uh, uh, Minister of, uh, of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, uh, of Germany is being labeled uh, uh, in the most gruesome, and I won't, I won't mention it uh, here, uh, um, uh, how. So there is an advertisement of Lidl and negation of Vucha. Advertisement of Lidl, <laughs> denazifying Ukraine. Advertisement of Lidl and all of the other Russian... Uh, uh, so I'm trying to say that with non-democratic forces in Serbia being extremely strong, <laughs> with our European partners from Realpolitik and European values, from Serbian government expecting only Realpolitik. Anything that is being asked from us is to find some kind of a deal with the Kosovo, turning a blind eye to the quality of democracy. And I'm saying without the quality of democracy, mm -hmm. without active citizens, without independent institutions, there is no political goal other than that, because if we are not resilient to the, to the disinformation, if we, are not, if, we don't, if, we, if we don't have trust institutions that they will protect us, then we are going to be the source of instability that some of European countries and European Union are fighting so, for, mm -hmm. uh, so much for this kind of uh, so-called uh, uh, stability of democracy without any kind of values. Thank you very much. Now, before we move on to... Before we move on to talk about the measures and levers that we can use to influence the situation that you have described, let me ask both uh, Ms. Strack-Zimmermann and Ms. Hobhaus to, in the same spirit of introspection, talk a little bit about our own houses. And um, Ms. Strack-Zimmermann, if you look at the recent results of state elections in Bavaria and Hessen, how concerned are you about increasing polarization in this country and the rise of the far right in this country? Because we saw quite positive results for the AFD in both of these Western Bundesländer. <clears throat> to make the message short, we have to solve the problems. We have problems in Germany, and it's not only a question in Germany, it's also a question in Europe about people are, are nervous about migration and uh, not migration in questions of that we need people coming to Germany, of course, to be part of our country. Without migration, we are lost, this, this uh, economic, um, this rich country. But we have a huge problem with um, migration, with people who are in Germany, and uh, they have no right to be here. But it's a problem to send them back to the countries because other countries say thank you very much. And so people are afraid about it. And so we have to solve this problem. And uh, we have to find a way, not only in government, also together with the opposition. I think it's very, very important in this case that we work together, that we are, I mean, you, you never be a unit. I mean, we are different parties. We have different um, views of uh, uh, solving problems. But we have to find a way, and then I'm sure that we could manage the situation. 
I mean, it's, you know, it's senseless to cry and to say, oh, I mean, people, we have a free country, they could vote whatever they want, so we have to solve the problems now and immediately. And then if I may jump over to MP Hobhouse, polarization and populism clearly contributed uh, to the Brexit vote. Uh, and some observers see these forces, populism and polarization, as both a cause and a consequence of a crisis of conservatism in the UK. Would you agree with that? Well, we've got a voting um, system that is like in the States and in other countries across the world that are associated to the British Commonwealth is still majority voting systems. And therefore, um, a, a party like the IFD uh, can disappear in one of the big parties. And it, they've done that in the Tory party. So basically, the Tory party is to a large extent to a large extent controlled by forces that are probably similar to the IFD, although they're not exactly the IFD. And that's the difficulty that um, the Tories, the moderate conservatives, they're leaving. In fact, nobody has probably noticed in 2019, Boris Johnson actually purged the Conservative Party of um, moderate conservatives. And there's still people who are now finally leaving in disgust. They're not forming a new party. The Labour Party in the 1970s actually split and formed um, the Social Democrats. So there was a split in the Labour Party. But the conservatives, in the end, always stay together for power reasons, um, but allow themselves to be overtaken and infiltrated by very right-wing forces. And that is what has happened in the in the last uh, 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 few years. I do want to say something, that, though, about Britain and possibly also the States. The, dif the difference is that they are old democracies, and dif definitely Britain is an old democracy. And there, I have some hope, I always have hope, that actually these countries are fighting back. It's difficult, but we do have a very strong sense of um, the importance of the institutions. And we are going to have a new election, and in, in, indeed in the States, Biden has won the election. It was narrow, Trump could win again, but that, it was great that Biden won. We now have a new election in, 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 in the UK, and I think there will, is, there's going to be a change of government. And as long as that is possible, as long as people don't vote to end democracies by ending voting and free votes and free voting, then countries can fight back. And Britain is fighting back. And that is why it is so important that we make sure that the, ones, the one thing that is so fundamental to democracies, open liberal democracies, is a fair voting system and, and free and open votes and no restrictions to them and all the rest of it. And I also agree, of course, um, the independence of the courts is very important. All of those are things that are fundamental to liberal democracies and sometimes people don't know about that and then they vote to end those democracies. So what is important? We need to educate young people, as you said. We need to make sure that those values are deeply embedded in people. So. Uh, people can fight back and flat fresh elections and establish again uh, all those things that we are talking about and make sure that democracies don't end through an election. Thank you very much. So, so let us talk now about how external cooperation and outreach can help to influence um, and bolster European values and institutions uh, in all of the countries represented here. But I'd like to begin, if I may, with the accession process and the Eastern neighborhood. And uh, we heard Marta Lempart make a very uh, strong appeal uh, there uh, to essentially make the beacon shine again in hopes that we will then see active participation also in Eastern Europe in the upcoming uh, uh, elections. So perhaps I can begin with you, uh, Marta Lempert, and ask you to talk a little bit uh, about what that kind of outreach can look like. Uh, you described to us the backsliding, uh, the painful uh, undermining of, of institutions, of the courts, and so on. What do you want right now from the EU? Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, I would like to point out that the rule of law crisis, uh, that is the Polish rule of law crisis, is also European rule of law crisis, but not in the way that everybody thinks like this is the common thing. No. 
because we have a situation when we have an independent court, European Court of Justice, that imposed, I think, 18 interim measures on Polish government to be imposed by Polish judiciary, and then we have European Commission sitting down with the defendant, with the entity that the interim measures are, are imposed against, negotiating them, negotiating the content of the rulings made by an independent European court. Let that sink in. How betrayed we are, how betrayed we feel, how betrayed Polish judges feel. So we have European Commission saying, yeah, there is this ruling by the European Court of Justice, but don't worry about it. You, you can do this and this, you can ignore. That's what's happening now. That's what's happening beside the, beside the scene. No, they don't even hide it. So that's the thing, that, that would, it would be great if it stopped. If the executive power would not break the rule of law in the European Union, undermining the rulings by, of the European Court, because that's what's happening in, to, to, to the rulings made by European Court of Justice, and that's appalling. So that's, thing, that, that's the thing. The second thing is the time, timeline thing. Uh, the timeline, no, maybe the narrative thing. The narrative thing, all authoritarian governments feed on this that for European institutions, for many people working in European institutions, for many servants in the European institutions, it's business as usual. And using the words like dialogue and concern, there are actually mock accounts saying how concerned the European Commission is, how concerned the EU is. Like the word concern is the words that you can throw at people like us. Just stay silent if you don't have anything to say. So this kind of laziness and ignorance and arrogance and pretending that something is being done while hiding uh, uh, just with the words that don't mean anything. They don't only mean nothing to us, they mean nothing to our government. Not acknowledging that governments like Polish, like Hungarian, when they hear dialogue, they think you're weak. They think that they are at their good, like they don't have to do anything. Giving signs, the, all this concern, dialogue, negotiation, whatever thing, is signs of weakness for authoritarian governments. Not answering force by force, not calling things by their names, not acknowledging what's, what's happening. I hear it all the time, Polish government, uh, it's very concerning. No, it's not very concerning what Polish government is go doing. Polish government are criminals. That's what's happening. It's not concerning that they are doing some things. <laughs> so that's the thing, that's the narrative thing. And the last thing is the timeline thing. I'm sick and tired of grown up people paid a lot of money in European institutions telling me how hard their job is. Because that's happening constantly. I say, this and this should happen. Yeah, but you know, but to, for that to happen, this and this and it takes time. I don't care. This is not a therapy group. <laughs> I don't care. I can tell you how hard my job is, but I'm not doing that. I'm an adult. We're all adults here. So I don't want to hear how hard it is for you to do your job. I don't care. <laughs> Find someone else to do that. Because it's so annoying, this complaining how hard your job is. <laughs> I don't care. If your professionals do your job, our time counts in days, their time counts in months. I don't want to hear that this timeline that is put on us is the institutional timeline. You should be adapting to my timeline, not I. I am forced to adapt to yours. This is something wrong with the system. You are serving me. Thank I'm you. not serving you. Thank you. <laughs> let, let me go to Ambassador Makayev, who clearly has a very hard job. Uh, you told us you'd like to, that the EU needs to take your country by the hand. Um, how does that look? What are the concrete acts that that, that would entail? Uh, and second question, if you, if, so briefly, if you would. Um, second question, what do you say to people who say that the EU is simply not ready to absorb Ukraine and that major reforms would be required of the EU itself uh, in order for it to really walk the talk on membership? Oh, welcome back to the therapy room. <laughs> Um, I, I do understand those, uh, those people uh, who, uh, who, who say European Union needs to be, to be reformed. Um, we've heard uh, about uh, a major disease back in uh, 2005 
uh, after referenda in, in, uh, in France and Netherlands that actually EU is a sick organism, needs time to pause, uh, to, uh, to digest uh, uh, different waves of, uh, of enlargement. We've heard about uh, the brain dead NATO, uh, and th those are, are things uh, which, which are being usually discussed in those therapy rooms. Uh, but the difference is uh, that, um, well, after, after the words of sympathy and solidarity, uh, the deeds uh, shall, uh, shall come uh, and judge people not by words by, uh, but uh, by, by deeds. Uh, I do realize that uh, with Ukraine as a member of the European Union, many procedures uh, need to be, uh, to be adapted also for, uh, for future uh, enlargement. And this is why we say just invite Ukraine to those discussions. Invite uh, a future uh, member of the European Union to, uh, to those discussions uh, how to shape this, this new Europe. So we, after joining the European Union, uh, we, uh, we are in a kind of negotiated environment. Uh, we also share and we also uh, made it that, uh, that great. Uh, and once again, what is, what is important for, for our accession uh, to, to the European Union, those f uh, recommendations that have been put by the European Commission, uh, they, are, they are very uh, pragmatic, uh, and our government uh, had a plan to, to fulfill those recommendations. You remember in my uh, opening remarks, uh, I said uh, that actually those were Ukrainian um, NGOs uh, who appealed to the European Union uh, to provide us uh, guidance uh, uh, for for a future membership, and now uh, I'm I'm reading not from my talking points, uh, but from uh, the um, document composed by our um, NGOs, um, which is called uh, um, Candidate uh, Check. Uh, and they have given us uh, 8.1 out of 10 for implementing uh, a recommendation of the European Commission. So this is uh, kind of a very, uh, very great figure. Thank you for underlying the role of NGOs. I see Marta nodding vigorously uh, to that. Raza, when it comes to accession, Serbia knows quite a bit uh, about the challenges. You officially applied for EU membership in 2009. You entered into accession negotiations in 2014. Progress has been slow, to put it rather euphemistically. Recent studies show that the vast majority of the Serbian population is now actually opposed to EU membership. Are the delays on the EU side contributing to the process of democratic backsliding and mistrust that you have described? It's a, it's a really complex issue because it's not only on the, on the European Union and how European Union uh, or member states are treating Serbia, it's also on the domestic level. The main partner for the EU in Serbia is the regime. Regime that is using media to undermine the EU. So this information that we were talking about is not uh, uh, installed in Serbia to promote Russia. So that's one of the first misconceptions about the state of media in Serbia. It's to vilify the West. It's to ride on the wave of the negative emotions that are still present and being revived on a daily basis by the, the highest politicians in Serbia about the 99 bombing of Yugoslavia. We are being reminded who bombed us on a daily basis and then being offered, would you like to join uh, to be part of them? There is also a second part of the problem because our regime is, uh, when, when they are talking to the Western partners, they are the most pro-European, pro-Western interlocutors. Back at home, when they're addressing the, uh, the, 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 the nation, they're becoming uh, the ones who are undermining uh, the EU, to put it uh, euphemistically. When uh, Chancellor Scholz was in Serbia, uh, Serbian media reported about that visit, of course, it was important uh, uh, dignitary coming to Serbia. Do you know what are the two main messages conveyed on a daily basis uh, uh, for weeks, basically? That Germany wants to stab us in the back because, uh, I don't know, sorry, 
uh, that Germany wants us and the EU wants uh, to stab our friends, our brothers, Russians, uh, to introduce sanctions against Russia. That's the first message. And also to rip part of our, uh, of our territory, to rip the Kosovo apart from Serbia. So two things that are uh, being connected with, with Germany at that point was to stab our friends in the back and to get rid of our uh, uh, motherland, Kosovo. Uh, in this kind of environment, talking about European uh, integration is the only voice of the pro-European pro voices, pro-democratic voices, are few from the civil society and really scattered intellectuals. And what we are saying here, help us deconstruct this media apparatus. Because how? without how? What would you demonetization, yeah. I mentioned, I mentioned uh, how European companies are unknowingly, I hope unknowingly, supporting financially this media apparatus. Uh, there is, on September of 17th, on the number one watched TV station in Serbia, that is by a lot of European and yeah, Western embassies, in a, for, in a recent months labeled as pro-democratic, pro-Western. There is interlocutor in a morning show. So this is when we're talking about how Serbian citizens are basically being victims of this uh, uh, manipulation. In 8, 19 in the morning, the person who was seven times in the past couple of months in that morning show saying the following, Germans are key here. What they didn't finish in 1945 when they brought great harm to our regions, they are trying now. Germany is trying to take place that America has in the world. They're trying to take that place in Europe. After that comes the Lidl advertisement. <laughs> so, Too bad we don't have Lidl on our panel. But, <laughs> but we, I hope that we have uh, some kind of a consensus that uh, against this kind of machinery, bare-handed citizens in Serbia, there are a few of us, is really hard to fight. And when we have European administration cheering the Serbian regime and turning the blind eye to the state of democracy, calling this, by the way, this TV is being called pink. So this pink TV calling uh, as an actor of democracy, as being actor mm -hmm. of the Western values, is something which actually is paradoxically working against every uh, hope of the Serbia being part of the European Union. So I'm calling the EU to start working on the quality of democracy to check uh, and question the state of the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So the fundamentals first. We will solve if we are democratic, if we are open, if we are uh, honestly trying to join the EU we will find a solution for the, uh, with our friends and brothers from Kosovo. Otherwise, this conflict is going to be the burden on our uh, back for decades uh, long. Thank you. With an eye on the clock, I'd like to make uh, a kind of a cut there and now move us to talk about European defense in a new age. But by defense, I mean, and I'm certainly going to also want to talk about uh, European solidarity with Ukraine, but I'd like to start by going over the bridge of disinformation that you have just uh, offered to us, because we are seeing a massive increase in malicious, uh, influences uh, in disinformation, in cyber attacks, and so on. So perhaps I can ask uh, both uh, MPs uh, who are with us here to talk a little bit about how you see that within the overall European defense approach. Uh, and Ms. Strack Zimmerman, if you would get us started, please, and um, you know, talk about that piece, if you would, but also tell us, uh, we're hearing a lot about strategic autonomy, we're hearing a lot about European defense, but is Europe actually in a position to defend itself? Not really, I would say. Um, you just talk about, it's really interesting to, to, to uh, this panel, um, interesting for, for our work here too, um, because it's not only the question that other countries would attack Europe with weapons. The huge thing, the, the immense uh, challenge is the hybrid war, yeah. what you are talking about. And if you believe it or not, it's the same in Germany. So 
it's a question in the world wide net. You could read so terrible, stupid things. I mean, really. You, you, read, you read it and it's unbelievable that people believe this sorry bullshit. But we have to realize that this is also the reason why the AFD will be so successful. Mm -hmm. Because people don't ask, people, you know, they, they, of course not everybody, but many, many people believe really in everything. And uh, I think we have to realize that this would be the, really the, 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 the weakness of Europe. And we have to talk about, and I, have, I tell you the truth, now I have no solution how we could manage this problem. I mean, we have law, and it's, it's not easy to stop it, because we have, of course, in, in, in um, um, our law, and to tell your opinion, I mean, it's, it's very important, and to find the, you, you know, what could you say, and what it's definitely wrong. I, I, I mean, um, and, and you ask me, could Europe defend the own continent? And I would say, till now, not really. We have to find a new working together in these questions, and we have to stop to be so naive. Um, you know, there are so many people, I don't know, um, where they are the last 20 years, what happens in this world. So we, ha we have to realize that there are many countries and they want countries and they want to destroy Europe. They want to destroy our peace and our freedom. Yeah. And this peace and freedom, it's very young. It's only nearly 80 years old, nearly less. So we have to realize there are many countries who are interested in to kill Europe and we have, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's our opinion, that we need in Europe, in the future, also a committee of defense. We have to sit together to explain mm -hmm. what we could do. And it's not enough that uh, this committee, it's an uh, under, under, under committee about the foreign policy. I mean, it's, it's nothing. And we have to change this immediately to survive in the future. Thank you very much. And I think we've... We've seen those foreign malign influences at work, for example, in the Slovakian elections. Uh, the rise in disinformation associated with those elections was absolutely astonishing. Um, MP Hophaus. So the only way we can fight against um, misinformation and all that conspiracy theories and all that nonsense that is going on, it is, of course, a form of democracy, if you wish. Um, and I'm not against that if people can express what they believe and their fears and so on and so forth. But we need to equip people with um, the resilience to actually question conspiracy theories and all the rest of it. And that is by understanding the importance of trusted sources, um, of critical thinking. All of that has to start very early. That has to start with young people. That has to start in schools. That has to start with how we educate our young people about to become critical thinkers, to trust information or mistrust information or the sources where they're coming from. That's what I would like to say about um, the, the online challenge. Um, I, I also want to talk about um, the defense, um, and that is a military defense. Um, and um, I always say the, the UK never lets its own people and other people forget that it is a military power um, that is there to fight wars, um, and that um, its strongest um, interest is always, the Brit British strongest interest has always been in NATO, and a lot of Brexiteers have said NATO is actually the guarantor for the, for the peace in Europe. And I think that's two things. We have to learn, um, and we as Germans, and I'm originally from Germany, as you probably know, um, for us it's difficult to think about a military defense of our democracy. Yeah? We had the uh, uh, Americans who could do it with all that dirt, yeah? We, 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 we thought we could live in pre freedom and wouldn't have to take up arms again. And I think Germans have to think again. Um, we need a, a, a strong military defense, and I've talked to um, you, Ambassador, about Boris Johnson coming to Zelensky and unequivocally offering military support for Ukraine. They needed that. And that is why Boris Johnson, although he's a liar, is still a hero in Ukraine. Remember that we need a military defense and the European Union needs to put its 
um, uh, mind to it. And one last thing I want to say, um, following up on the discussion that we had earlier about some sort of complacency within the European institutions. The Europe has carelessly lost the UK out of European club. A strong democracy. Why did that happen? All of you who are still in the European Union, think about it. It was careless, and the European Union is still careless about bringing UK, the UK back into the European family. I'm here to make that case that you need um, the UK and the UK needs Europe, and I find there's a degree of lameness about actually making that effort that the UK will come back into the European Union and the European family. Please think about it. The, Euro the UK government currently is not very interested in, in the EU, and I fear the EU is not particularly interested in the UK. I think that is a massive mistake. Think about the relationships that the European Union has to build with the UK again. Thank you. I know, I know that MP Strack Zimmerman must, must leave us soon, but I do want to use uh, just a very quick last round to talk about European support for Ukraine. And may I ask one question to Marta Lempert before I come oh, to you? Okay. Um, because, of course, um, Marta, Poland was one of the very first countries to cast the Russian invasion in a geopolitical context as the potential source of worldwide con conflagration. Those were the words of, uh, of the Polish president uh, when the war began. Poland's support for Ukraine had led some observers to talk about an eastward shift in the central gravity of Europe, uh, that the center of gravity was moving eastward, until recently. We've now seen Poland distancing itself, indicating that it might halt arms deliveries, uh, and also maintaining restrictions, along with Hungary and Slovakia, on grain imports from Ukraine, despite the European Commission's suspension of its own ban. So is that center of gravity starting to wobble? You gave a very firm statement of support for Ukraine, but is it still widely shared in your country? First, I, <clears throat> I have to say that Poland is not the Polish government that is, in spite of using the propaganda and stolen money, at the support of 30% voters. So it's not Poland. Poland is Polish society. In, in its Polish society that, to, that got into the war response with our own means. And if you think about Polish NGOs, this is something that not many people know. There is not even one NGO in Poland on the democratic side that would not be in the war response somehow. Uh, on the side of everything else that we're doing. So this is the, the civic landscape, also on the, on, basically on the democratic side. So I, I, I try not to comment on whatever Polish government is doing because they are evil and they are liars. And the only thing, the only reason that they got so into supporting Ukraine to make, it was to make Germany angry, to make Brussels angry, to be on the other side. <laughs> I know they pretended to be Ukraine's friends, but we know, see now what's happening. On the outside, they're undermining crucial Ukrainian interests. And on the inside, the treatment of Ukrainian newcomers is abhorrent. If it wasn't for Polish citizens, if it was for Polish society, people would starve, people would have no shelter. And it's not like people who lived in, in our homes and we accepted new hunger, newcomers in our homes because we're so, such a generous nation. It was because our government wouldn't provide them with anything. They are taking all social benefits away. They are taking all support away. They are shutting down all relocation services. They are shutting down all, all services that are for Ukrainian newcomers. And they are actively running anti-Ukrainian campaign, neo-Nazi-fueled anti-Ukrainian campaign in this election. So this is Poland, so this is Polish government, and I know that Polish president pretended to be a friend of Ukraine. And I know that I put Mr. Ambassador in, in, in a very difficult position here, but of course I'm the anti-government uh, civic activist, so of course it can be filtered by this. But please see the, see the difference. Poland is not Polish society. Polish civic society also is on the side of Ukraine, obviously, because we know how important this war is because it's our war also and that we would be helpless 
without Ukrainian army standing for us every day and losing their lives and putting everything on the line. But Polish government, I can answer for them. I don't care why they changed their minds or I don't care what they decided to show their true colors. I don't, I, I don't mm -hmm. analyze their decisions. I've stopped a long time ago. Of course, they are dangerous. This is scary because they might shift their stance on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. every three months. So imagine you will have this staunch Ukraine supporter and this government that fights everybody for Ukraine's interests, and three months later you will have uh, a government that blocks everything and blocks all the help for Ukraine. This is the toddler on the, on the floor on the, of the supermarket. Mm -hmm. You don't negotiate with it. Thank you. Ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador, when you look at the political map of Europe, including now post-Slovakian elections, when you look at the fact that we're now entering a second winter um, with the war still going on, how confident are you about European and Western support going forward? Well, I'm comfortable. Uh, and you know, we diplomats uh, and, and, and officials, uh, we, we deal uh, with, with countries and with the people and with whole societies. Uh, and uh, the people who elect uh, from time to time in a democratic manner their, their governments. Uh, and I need to say that uh, the, the level of support by Europeans uh, made it possible that all the governments in Europe uh, reacted that in support of Ukraine from the, from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, as, as a diplomat, I cannot uh, allow myself to say, uh, I don't care. I care about everything. I care about the, the way the governments uh, react. I care uh, about the way the voters, um, deflected by Russian propaganda, uh, react. Uh, and uh, I, I care about, uh, about everything uh, because uh, without this support in the European societies, without this support by the governments without fighting propaganda and attempts of, uh, of, of, of Russia to, to destroy uh, this European solidarity and to inflict damages uh, in the European societies, we would not be successful as a united Europe. Uh, this is why it is key to, uh, to involve uh, everybody in this discussion about the future Europe, how to, how to reshape it. Uh, the good guys, the bad guys, uh, and, uh, well, we, we need to care about Europe uh, so Europe uh, gets well out of all uh, those challenges. And I'm absolutely sure, uh, well, Europe uh, can be proud of, uh, of uh, itself uh, in how they dealt with, uh, with the Russian uh, aggression. Uh, and we, as Ukrainians, we would encourage Europe as a new member of EU and NATO to learn uh, from, from our example. In terms of defense of Europe, in terms of uh, just, you know, checking what, what, what kind of ammunition is available for, uh, for our artillery and, uh, uh, and our air defense uh, systems. So we do not uh, try to find uh, that ammunition or, you know, uh, as it was the case back, back in last, last winter, generators. Uh, so there were no uh, IKEA supermarkets uh, on where to find generators that we badly needed at that time, and no government in Europe uh, could really provide us uh, with uh, with that amount of generators we uh, we needed. This is the Europe we are trying to uh, to reshape. Thank you very much. And <laughs> last word. Last word to Marie Agnes Strack Zimmermann, who has been a fervent, fervent advocate for defending European values in Ukraine. So please. Um, yes, as long as it takes. And it means that we have to do everything what we could do. And you know, we always, this is very, in, in Germany, it's a normal thing. We have a lot of discussions. And afterwards, we are really good what we are doing. And I mean, this is a normal thing. But in this case, we have no time. This is a really problem. We have the discussions about the tanks for seven months last year. And in the, in the meanwhile, the Russians have enough time to prepare for these weapons coming. The same now with the discussion with the Taurus. 
It's the same discussion for months. I think Ukraine were asking for in April or May for the first time. Six months later, we have still this discussion, and that is absolutely, absolutely uh, impossible because you need these weapons now, and not one weapon is a game changer. It's you, you know, it's the whole the whole thing is a game changer, and the huge problem is the question of time, and we have no time. And if we want that Ukraine wins this war, they need our help now, today, and now. Thank you. So clearly part of reshaping Europe to defend European values at home and abroad is also, also moving fast, learning to really move beyond that slow stately process that many of you have described on different levels. Thank you so much to all of you for this very wide ranging and very, very informative discussion. Let's give them a warm round of applause. And you may take your seats once again, or you may return now to the Bundestag. Yes. Thanks again for being with us. And uh, we will move straight into our hackathon competition. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are not taking an official break right now, so uh, may I please ask everybody to, to please uh, return to your seats so that we can move straight into our next session. And as I mentioned earlier, over the past months, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, and you've just seen it in that film, has conducted a hackathon in eight regions around the world, calling for innovative ideas on how the EU can strengthen its role on the global stage and foster cooperation with each particular region. The eight individuals you're going to meet in just a moment are the winners of these regional hackathons. In the next half hour, each regional winner will have three minutes to present his or her idea. With us is an outstanding jury whom I'd like to quickly introduce. Please stand up, dear jury members, if you would. Thank you. Franziska Brandmann is chairperson of the German Young Liberals. Josef Lensch, which is Josef, yeah, there he is, is CEO of the Innovation in Politics Institute that's based here in Germany. And Dr. Milos Hodun is member of the European Liberal Forums Board, president of the Projekt Polska, and advisor to Nowoczesna, the Polish Liberal Party. So welcome to all three of you jury members. I know that you are going to be listening. Thank you. They are going to be listening very carefully to the pitches, and you should too, please, ladies and gentlemen, because after our lunch break, we are going to ask you to vote. The jury will provide its feedback on the pitches that we're going to hear. The criteria by which they're going to evaluate are impact, innovation, and feasibility, and then it's going to be your turn, dear guests. You will decide the winner by voting for your favorite on our event tool Mentimeter, and I'm going to tell you later how that works. Now, we're going to get started, and may I please ask the regional winters, all eight, winners, all eight of them, to join me here on stage. And I will then give a very brief introduction when you are all gathered up here. So come up here, right here in front.
Thank you so much. And hopefully you're already in the right geographic order. So Nico Stein will be representing, uh, speaking for the Western European Hackathon. Then we have Sorcheni Chongaili. Is that you? Very good. She is speaking for Southeast and Eastern Europe. The main uh, region is Nabila and Arab. Then we have Sub-Saharan Africa, Racine Gulizan. Southeast Asia, Norili Rania Jusli. South Asia, Dr. Pragati Singh. For North America, we have Sophie Holtzman. And for Latin America, we have Victoria Maria Vanna Feju. And a very quick reminder, dear speakers, dear presenters, when it's your turn to present, you will step forward. I will just briefly call you by your first name to the middle of the stage. Then a clock, you see it here, okay? That will count down your three minutes. You do have the option to th show three slides, but not more. And now let us begin with Nico. Take it away. Um, microphone? Ah, there you go. And you're going to pass off the microphone to each other. Hi, everyone. I'd like to pick up right where we left off and talk about European defense. European defense in the last years has been, become a symbol of um, overlapping structures and resulting inefficiencies. Just let me show you some examples. Currently, European militaries are fielding 16 different types of main battle tanks, while the United States have only one. We are having more than 12 different kinds of fighter jets, and worst of all, 27 distinct procurement processes for every single member state. This is, in our opinion, one of the main reasons why currently the European Union is not seen as a major actor in security and defense worldwide, despite our huge defense spendings, which combined outnumber, for example, Russia by far. This problem has also been seen by the European Union lately, which has introduced the EDERPA Act, which, uh, wants, which aims at giving incentives to member states to procure weapon systems jointly. But we think to really solve these problems, we have to go further. We have to think long term and also include development of new weapon systems to the process. And most importantly, we don't need to add a 28th procurement process to the European Union. We need just one. And that's why we want to combine all the 27 procurement processes in the European Union into one at the EDA, the European Defense Agency, and pull all of them together. We think that this solution has vast uh, benefits for all involved parties. First of all, the member states will stay in full control of everything that they purchase in the end, especially type and quantity of weapon systems. And we will strengthen the alliance with the United States because we are building on the European pillar of NATO and making Europe finally the power that can be and should have always been. In our, in our opinion, this way we strengthen the European industrial base that we desperately need for defense and we, in accordance with our liberal values, promote innovation by helping to create healthy competition between our different companies that we have in the European Union by single European tendering processes for our weapon procurement systems. So, let me finish with saying that in our opinion, combining all of our procurement processes together will help to make Europe the formidable force for democracy that it should have always been and be able to defend European values and liberal democracies in the world. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much to Nico Stein. And next up is Sorcha. Please, you have the floor. Hello everybody, my name is Sorka and alongside my colleague Alexia from Romania we work together on a project that we hope will bridge the gap between Eastern Europe and Western Europe as it stands. We see in opinion polls that Eastern Europe feels left behind and that's a big concern. We speak about wanting to be one Europe. We speak about wanting to have one strategy to handle crisis. We speak about wanting to communicate as a team. 
but yet a vast majority of our members feel left behind, that's not great. So we sat down and we tried to figure out a solution. And we realized that a lot of the institutions are currently based in Northwest Europe. Is that ideal? No. Historically, it made sense when the European Union was founded that a lot of these places would be there, given that's where the vast majority of founding states were. But we can change that. So our proposal was to bring the DG for neighborhood enlargement out to Eastern Europe. Why? Because that's where a vast majority of their work is taking place. And if people can feel connected on a local level, the work will be more impactful. But also we create a European hub of democracy that's not centered in Benelux. The Brussels bubble is real. I live in the middle of it. And realistically, often we get caught in the ideological of what we could do when really if we were able to be there on the ground and have conversations with people and actually see the impact of our work, it makes enlargement far easier. For example, if you're a young person living on the border of Moldova with Romania and you see that there's an institution near you, it's far easier to mentally see how you're going to engage in that union. It is not just about joining and having a European passport. It's not about that. Realistically, what it's about is that these decisions that are made for you are made by you and on the ground. And also on top of that, from a language perspective and an employment perspective, it just opens up all the doors that we need to reduce the amount of kind of Western migration that we have continuing. So this is kind of what we wanted instead. So ideally we would like to see a situation where we have a better kind of state of play. This isn't working, but yeah, a better state of play where we'd have a hub in Romania and then we'd have our hubs in the Benelux. That will remain because we can't take them away. I don't think we want any riots, but this would be the easier solution for everybody long term. And yeah, that was kind of the thought process we had. We felt like it will bridge that gap too because it brings some sort of meaningful reason for us to engage too, that it's not just me over here and you're all the way over here. I hope that makes some sense. <laughs> Before we restart the clock, let's check that the clicker is working. It was not working for you? Okay, there we do seem to have it working. So I'm sorry, Sorcha, for the uh, technical uh, issue. And now we go to Nabila. Please, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. When it comes to the migration and refugees crisis, especially from the MENA region towards Europe, it has escalated a lot, especially recently. When we want to focus on that issue in Lebanon after the, po the economic crisis and the Syrian refugees crisis, there are around 800,000 unadjusted refugees who are poised to embark to irregular migration, passing from Lebanon and crossing the borders of the EU, through Greece and Italy. Actually, it's estimated that this year 10,000 uh, refugees will be crossing the borders uh, of the EU and uh, through 75 boats. And actually, last year, 27% out of these refugees, out of the 60% of the successful uh, migration, irregular migration process, were Syrians. And tragically, 17% died in the sea. For that, our project solution under the name of Maritime Migration Matters. It's a, proje a project designed to, uh, to help these refugees fulfill their basic needs in addition to the European Union needs as countries when it comes to the labor, migration, uh, labor uh, market. So the refugees want to reach a, sec a third safe country rather than staying in Lebanon as a second safe country because it's not helping anymore. And the European Union as countries, they're in need of labor migration when it comes to low-skilled job opportunities. However, they need it to be organized and to be legally uh, and not to cause them issues. But people are going through the irregular processes because it's more trusted or accessible. So in our project, we have three pillars. The first pillar is legal assistance. It's going to be done through an online platform or a website, which organizes and helps them to be informed uh, and to have guidance about how to apply for, uh, for uh, opportunities, uh, for job opportunities in the EU. And also, it will help them to know the process, to know the requirements, to, do, to know the types about asylum seeking and also migration. The second thing is awareness. We're going to do them through awareness campaigns uh, in the refugees' communities 
to tell them about how risky and challenging it is to go through the irregular routes, you will die. And actually, there's the smuggling and the trafficking as well. And you can refrain to other accessible opportunities that we're going to guide you through it, through our platform and through our project. It's going to happen through the skilled capacity training, uh, mainly focusing on the breadwinners uh, to take a fully funded opportunity for language courses in addition to uh, technical uh, trainings uh, accredited from EU institutions so that it will ease the process of them being accepted in the EU and be integrated easily in the job market. Finally, this project is a benefit of everyone, the EU and the refugees. If you want it to happen, vote for us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. And now over to Racine. The, is it working? Not working. Hang on, something. Okay, I think we turned it off. No. Do, do we have anybody who can give us a hand with the technology of the clicker? Okay, I think we got it working again. It seems to be a bit, you know, in, instable. So, over to Racine. Ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, allow me to tell you about Amina. Amina is a young, dynamic entrepreneur based in Abidjan. Amina dream to expand your solar energy businesses for Brighton uh, community. For okay. Amina dream to expanding a. Uh, uh, solar business energy for brighten our community and creating jobs. However, a dream faced a significant obstacle, a lack of funding. That's when Amina crossed but with an unabsated early name, Invest Now. The transformative platform not only connected, not only embraced Amina's initiative, but connected with Thomas, a German investor, and urgent environmental advocate. Thanks to this financial alliance, thanks to this financial alliance, flourishing Amina's business, creating job and sustainable partnership between Africa and Europe. Just like Amina, 30% of small African businesses struggle to secure the funding the founder needs, resulting 330 billion deficit. Meanwhile, the European investor like Thomas, like Thomas, are willing and ready to invest, but viable and profitable opportunities elude them. Invest now present Invest now present as bridge a ice bridge of opportunities and possibilities connected African entrepreneur and European investor for write a stories of economic success. The operation on the platform is quick, simple. The entrepreneur and startup register on the platform and showcase their project. The European investor, after register, see and identify promising opportunities. And our back office team facilitates operation and ensuring, money, ensuring rigorous investment monitoring. This is a prototype on the platform. Imagine a future where young, the young African see opportunities flourishing on the continent without risking their line on Peru's crossing on Lampedusa or Mediterranean shore. So let's unpack together our exiting Transcontinental Adventure. Support Invest Now. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And I'm going to let uh, Nureli try the clicker before we begin. Okay. Working? OK, very good. So we will start the clock. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Nureli Rania, and my partner, Dean Dilaina, have an idea on how we could bridge the gap between EU and ASEAN. Meet Chin. Chin is a, a young activist from Myanmar, a country that is in a global spotlight due to its ongoing struggle against the military junta. Chin Voices is just one of the many that is crying out loud for human rights, democracy, and justice in his homeland. But Chin's story is not unique. There are many others like him in, across Southeast Asia that is fighting for justice. Where there is a global crisis in democratic backsliding, this project will invoke participatory democracy that will provide chances to these ASEAN youths and Southeast and East Asia youths to have a chance to, take, to make change in their communities. Inter Catalyzer, the ASEAN Changemaker Ambassadors. These initiatives will not only solve this, the issue, but it will also strengthen the relationship between ASEAN and EU. Now let's see how the catalyzer will help Chin's journey in his uh, human rights journey. Chin's selected for the Education for Active Citizenship online program. He learns about digital advocacy skills and how to navigate the political landscape in his home country. Empowered, Chin launches a social journalism project in which we, he will fight and this disseminate awareness about his fight in the social media. Then he will go to, the, to a study tour in Europe in which he will see hands-on on the democracy norm in this country in which he will apply in his own country back home. During the action in, during the action, sorry, during the implementation phase, the the digital advocacy, the social journalism project that Chin is doing in his country will make a ripple effect, which will then motivate others, the youth and other uh, communities in his country to, to join with his uh, cause and fight for their rights. Then, after he had managed to do so in a six months timeline, he will enter the prestigious ASEAN EU Youth Connect Networks, in which this will not only be a personal efforts. Now, let's see how does Catalyzer strengthen EU and ASEAN relationship. There is two, which it will invoke people-to-people -people connection and promotion of common values. This project will be a symbol that EU EU's pivotal role in promoting global human rights and democracy across the regions and the whole world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And Fragati, take, take a quick test of the clicker. Yes. Yes, no? It's not working. OK. Can, <laughs> Yet. can somebody, uh, oh, who, oh there. there we go. It is working. No, you were not supposed okay. to see this. So yet. over to you, Fragati. We start the clock. Right. A wise person once said, everything else seems more important till you fall sick. And then you realize what was most important all along. Some of you would say that health is a fundamental right, and I would dispute that and say that health is the most fundamental right. And yet, across the world and for the longest time, there are some groups that have been deprived of this fundamental right till today. Take, for example, this survey from India which showed that up to 82% of young queer people could not think of a single doctor they could trust if they disclosed their identity. But this problem also exists on the other side of the table. When you look at medical professionals, up to 50% of them in EU themselves did not feel equipped with the tools to treat an LGBTI patient well. And as somebody who has gone to medical school and is from a marginalized identity, I don't just have an acute understanding of the problem, but also a deep insight into how to solve it. 
That's how a few years ago, I started developing on my idea called Curate. Curate is an ecosystem that tries to solve for both sides of this problem. One, it trains and builds capacity in young medical professionals to give them the tools that they need. And then on the other hand, it gives the community a ready access to a comprehensive directory of these trained professionals. And then, by providing a peer-reviewed curating system, it allows the community to keep feeding back into the healthcare professional directory, keeping it credible and updated. This is how I plan for Curate to improve healthcare uptake by the community first, thereby include improving healthcare outcomes and contributing significantly to universal health coverage, something that the EU takes very seriously. At the UN SDG General Assembly this year, I was present and I saw an unprecedented focus on one SDG, SDG 3 for good health and well-being. If we are to go by the recent report by EU when it comes to their progress from April to 2023, we can see that EU has made huge strides of progress in this SDG. In fact, a few years ago, they concluded a pioneering project called Health for LGBTI, which has tried to solve the very problem we're now trying to solve in our geographies. This makes me hopeful that with the right support, guidance, and knowledge transfer, we can make universal health coverage for these marginalized identities a reality in my part of the world, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, give it a try, the clicker. Let's, yep, there we go. Okay, Thanks. I think, right? Yes. I think so. so, over to Sophie. The transatlantic alliance between the EU and the US is at a crossroads, and how we move forward from here will define the future. Now more than ever, with the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, it is crucial that we decrease polarization worldwide and move beyond capital cities such as Brussels and Washington, D.C. to promote European values. Creating a new generation of political staffers that can work across the aisle and create better transatlantic policies is possible with the six provisions of our project beyond Brussels and Washington, D.C. The first provision of this project is the selection of a U.S. in an EU location for study trips that will include political staffers from both regions. In these locations, local organizations will be engaged to ensure a culturally immersive experience. Next, a logistical coordinator will organize a schedule that includes meetings with NGOs and governmental organizations, as well as modules on comprehensive policy making. These study tours will be an educational experience for all participants that will allow them to gain bipartisan perspectives on transatlantic policies. Following that step, a selection committee will choose a selection of politically, geographically, and socioeconomically diverse applicants to represent the US and the EU on these study tours. Following two online prep sessions, two one-week-long study tours will commence that will include participants from both the U.S. and the EU. These study tours will conclude with each participant creating a community engagement proposal. This proposal will solidify their commitment to transatlantic goals in their own communities. The final step will be an alumni network that will create a multi-generational transference of knowledge between the EU and the U.S. The impact of this program will take the EU-US exchange into the political reality of voters across the EU and the US. This will have a wide geographical reach and the impact will be threefold. The short-term impact will be the knowledge transfer of the exchange program itself between the political staffers who will represent the next generation of these regions. The mid-term impact will be increased awareness for inclusion of transatlantic aspects in the policy of both of these regions, and it will raise the salience of transatlantic issues in both United States and European Union policies. And finally, the long-term impact will be these staffers' contribution to lessening polarization worldwide and increasing collaboration between the U.S. and the EU. This exchange program can create prosperous democracies and a prosperous transatlantic alliance between two global powers for years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have Victoria, and let's just give the quick clicker. Yes. Yep, it worked. It okay, very good. Over to you. Let's start the clock. The Latin American region generates 300,000 tons of organic waste per day. And guess what? We haven't done anything with it yet. 
This waste is improperly disposed of in landfills, which contributes to global warming, poses health threats to the populations, and leads to soil and groundwater pollution. Mismanagement could be improved by the installation of biogas generation plants that turn organic waste into energy that can be used by the population. With its ambitious European Green Deal, the EU, the EU has made clear its commitment to climate, fight, climate change fight. Their experience with biogas generation plants is a unique opportunity for LATAM to learn from the EU. By doing so, we could create a strategic partnership to increase efforts against climate change in Latin America. Econectados will contribute to this knowledge exchange by implementing a web platform to connect local governments with Latin America, uh, with European companies and cooperation agencies willing to provide green financing in LATAM. Uh, biogas plants exist in a wide range of sizes, which make this project highly achievable. Local governments will upload to the web their biogas-related projects, and European companies and organizations will look for projects to fund, with showing with this their commitment to the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement. Um, once the plants are installed, organic waste they need will be provided by households and farmers, who will in turn receive a proportional discount on their energy bill. These contributions will be tracked by an app. Um, currently, there are only a few hundred biogas generation plants per country in Latin America, and most of them are not even functioning. Our project allows not only the installation of new plants, but also the recovery of existing ones. Biodigestion generates a high-quality fertilizer leftover that can be sold to agricultural producers in the region, uh, and this is one of the ways in which we will finance our initiative. Um, the European Union uh, has made the fight against climate change a priority, and our project promotes strategic partnership between the EU and LATAM to contribute to the EU environmental objectives. This project is also beneficial for Latin America, as it provides critical funding for the region and that is necessary in order to, to achieve uh, energy transition, increase energy independence, and improve the quality of life of the people. Support the Conectados, change the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very impressive. Thank you so much to all of you. Clearly, the jury has a hard job ahead of it. They will be deliberating on what they have just heard and seen now over the course of the lunch break. And you can do the same, dear ladies and gentlemen. You can also exchange perspectives on these very, very interesting initiatives. And then, when we return at 1.30 p.m. after the break, we will have a chance to hear the jury's feedback. And after that, we will all vote. So the lunch is going to be served up here. Uh, if you're sitting in the audience, it's, well, when you, when you walk in that direction, it'll be to the left. And you can also take the opportunity to quickly visit the stands and see the Friedrich Naumann Foundation's exhibition on Europe in the world. You'll see some uh, stands here at the back of the auditorium. So I wish everyone a pleasant break, and we'll see each other back here in about an hour and 20 minutes. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you again. Well done.
so. But. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a pleasant uh, lunch break, hopefully also a chance to exchange perspectives on some of the fascinating insights and contributions we heard earlier today. Now, without further ado, we are going to get feedback on those very, very interesting pitches that we heard before the lunch break. And our jury members, as you will remember, are going to provide feedback to each pitcher on the basis of three criteria, which are impact, innovation, and feasibility. And we begin with feedback to the pitch Western Europe. That's Nico Stein from Franziska Brandman. And I would just suggest that whoever is getting that feedback should please step forward a bit so that you can interact uh, and make eye contact. Please, go okay. ahead, Francisca. First of all, thank you so much for all your amazing pitches. I think I can definitely say for all of the jurors that we were quite you know, excited to look into what the future of our continents might be and what the future of liberalism can bring to the world. So first of all, I think a big round of applause to all of them. So that being said, I think I'm going to also acknowledge one other thing. Sorry, but I have to do this. Uh, I was really excited to see so many women on the stage. Uh, I think that's really cool. You know, we often say, <laughs> Uh, the, the future of the world is also definitely feminist and, uh, and definitely um, yeah, feminine. So I'm really excited to have so many um, women here on the stage. With that being said, moving to the only man yeah, uh, who did a great pitch on, I think, what is a very important and very urgent problem that Europe is facing. I think what the pitch did very well is like tackle the thing that's most important now. I think we heard a great panel today in the morning about how defense and everything that we hold dear to our hearts has to be defended, and that means um, defending it with weapons. Um, definitely, when people want to take away what's ours or what we hold dear, I think we have to be able to defend ourselves, and I think that was really great to the point, and I really loved it. Um, I think it was also innovative, because you didn't think about, you know, a lot of politicians telling us what's not possible, and um, the defense industry telling us this is absolutely impossible. So I think I really valued this innovative approach, and I think it was really great, and also kind of not um, minding about these barriers. That being said, I'm moving to feasibility. And this is kind of the downside, I think, of the problem. How is this project actually doable? And I think what we as the jury thought when we were in the discussion room was, we would have loved to see in this pitch what is the first step towards this pro project, or what's the second step, what's the third step? Like, how could you actually kind of do it, or how could the Friedrich Naumann Foundation um, do something towards this goal? And I think this is something that kind of had a downside to it compared to the other projects, but yet it was a, a, great, a great pitch, so thank you very much. Thank you. And now we go to feedback to the pitch from Southeast and Eastern Europe, and that feedback will be provided by Milo Schaudun. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, uh, for this fantastic event. Thank you. Thank you very much for the pitch. It was a very good pitch. I think you're a very talented presenter. And uh, we actually really like this pitch and this project. And uh, it was very interesting that your pitch was you know, shortly after this debate, when some of the debaters, I think most of them, mentioned many times that the topic about the division or between East and West, it's, it's crucial. It's important for the future of Europe. And this is what your project is about. So, uh, so it's, it's good, it's timely. Uh, I th we think also this is original, innovative, because it was, it was very different. Uh, it was very different, very sticking out, I think, y y your project. Uh, we also think it touches upon the very important topic of decentralization of the European Union in general. And we think this is, uh, this is, this is important. Uh, the thing is how this will really impact uh, the problem will really moving uh, one DG or more DGs to different European cities help European citizens to get connected uh, with the European Union? I can tell you that um, I live in Warsaw and literally 100 meters from my apartment there is Frontex and this did not really influence Polish people's you know, 
approach towards immigration or, or like uh, protection of, of, the, of the borders. So uh, we think it's a very good idea. The general topic is, is, is very good, but we are not very sure if we can, uh, you, can, you can accomplish these goals that you mentioned at the beginning with this one move. So you know, perhaps some more moves will be, uh, will be necessary because this gap, this gap that we're talking about is, is important. So this could be one of the things, but we think maybe more steps would be also needed to, to, you'll, have to need, you have, you'll have to add to this project so that we can actually bridge this gap. But thank you very much for the great pitch. Thank you. And now to Josef Lensch, who will give feedback to the pinch for MENA. Thank you for the great presentation and for, for the, the great pitch. Um, we discussed that of course, irregular migration, as we all know, is a huge issue for nation st states and Europe alike. So if you could really have an impact on this with such a proposal, we think, you know, on a scale from, from zero to 10, it would probably be a 10. So no question about impact. This is hugely important and hugely difficult as well. We also think that what you suggested is quite innovative. So. Um, the the multi-pronged approach, the systemic approach that you took, um, doing several things at the same time is quite innovative. However, we also thought that this is quite a challenge, that you're doing quite a lot of things at the same time. Um, and this was where we asked questions about feasibility. Perhaps in such a difficult circumstance with such a complex problem, um, you might want to focus on perhaps one thing one thing where it can make a difference, and one thing where you do really well, um, because there's already some solutions out there that you might have, uh, want to have a look at and see what can you do to really make a difference with one thing, and then also start small, start perhaps by prototyping, perhaps not with, with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, but perhaps with, with 10 people. Um, and try to understand, try to learn from them, as you wrote in your proposal, map the needs and really show on a small scale what difference you can make and then scale it up. Um, so overall, really hugely ambitious, very innovative, and perhaps you can work a little bit more on the feasibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next up is feedback to the pitch for Sub-Saharan Africa. That will again be me. Let me just... Let me just find it. Um, that was... Ras Rasil? Yeah. Energy? Yes. So we thought it was a very strong um, proposal. Um, we thought uh, it was really well presented. Also, um, how you um, designed the platform. Um, we think it's a big problem that you addressed. Uh, so it's really addressing a, a genuine need. Um, once again, we thought, how, how feasible is this? Uh, particularly in terms of marketing, we saw some challenges. So how do you actually spread the word about this? How do you communicate this? Because it's one thing to uh, prototype or develop such a platform, which is great and which is certainly needed. So it would also have certainly an impact. But the impact will only be realized if you are able actually to reach a lot of people, reach a lot of the stakeholders. So we thought the one challenge with this proposal might be to really spread the word um, and, and help uh, institutions and the stakeholders that you want to address to understand what difference you can make with this. But in terms of impact and in terms of innovation, we thought it was a really, really strong proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a slightly different order here in my list than the way that you are standing, but I see Francisca has the mic. So according to my list, next feedback pitch would be to North America. That's perfect. Exactly. Yeah, amazing. We switched it up a little bit because I thought, you know, there's so many women on the stage, the male presenters have to present a little bit more. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I usually see it the other way around often, so this is a, a nice change. Thank you so much for your pitch. And I think that we had a lot of pitches that were very innovative, but not that feasible. Um, this was a very different pitch. I think that was kind of like the only one where we thought, okay, feasibility is 10 out of 10. This is super feasible. But it's so feasible, I think it already exists. 
um, because I have been a staffer in the German Bundestag and I have been invited to a, problem, a program that was kind of similar. And also I was not convinced and my colleagues as well about is the transatlantic dialogue and the transatlantic friendship that we hold so dear, is it lacking exchange between staffers in the parliaments um, and in you know, the very professional politics sphere, or isn't it lacking a more general dialogue, especially in the younger generation? So that was a little bit where we thought it's very strong feasibility, it's not as innovative as the other pitches that we've seen. And I think especially when there is private um, investors or private actors such as the Atlantic Broker already having such a thing, we're not sure if it's in need of another kind of similar program. So I think this was one where we thought, we get the idea, it's super feasible. I could see somebody saying, this is great, and I'm just implementing it next week. So that was great, but it's lacking a bit on the innovation side compared to the other projects. But thank you so much for the great pitch, and thank you so much for the idea. And Next up, feedback to the pitch for Latin America from Milo Sodun. Thank you very much for the pitch. And uh, I'm, I was really happy to hear that it was really a global pitch because the, the issue, the problem is global, right? It, it connects us all because we're talking about climate. And so, so this, this is clearly something that I think FNS w w was looking for is this connection between Europe and other regions. And, and you showed it really clearly how we can how we, can, uh, how we can build this bridge be between the regions. Uh, so it was about the climate, and uh, I was very impressed by the, by the background knowledge that, that, you, that you gave us, about the data that you gave us, and uh, about the fact and that the recognition of the European Green Deal, that you see some of the, so, some of the European policies, main European commissions and European, European Union's projects, as something that, that connect uh, regions, Europe and other regions. I think this is, uh, this, this is uh, really, Great, and uh, so we think it was. I think it was different, innovative. It bu builds connections, uh, but then then we have the platform, which is of course the starting point. And and here I think what was uh, missing, or maybe not, there was not enough time for us to, to hear. Once you have the platform, which is a great idea, innovative with big potential, what next? How would you make this platform, you know, fully operational? Because we we see that the platform is only the first step, and. Uh, it's probably the easiest step also to create a website, a platform, but like, how do you develop it? How do you actually really reach stakeholders in Europe? How do you reach partners in Latin America so that this platform works and it's not just a, a website? And uh, also we are asking ourselves the questions, uh, is there anything before you produce or before you uh, start the platform that you should think about? For example, uh, I would be very interested in, in knowing this, this tons of, uh, of bio or organic waste, what happens uh, with them or to them in, in Latin America? Is the recycling system already existing? Do people recycle? Can we actually, do we actually have access to this waste already? Or we have to think about change of maybe mentality and thinking about how to, how to recycle it so that we can have this waste, organic waste at our disposal to start this big and ambitious project. But thank you very much. I hope this project will one day uh, come through. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe next is Josef giving feedback to the pitch Southeast Asia. Yes, thank you very much. The feedback on Southeast Asia. Um, so this was one of the uh, projects we thought um, th th that are more feasible so that we could see it to be realized, um, you know, perhaps next year or in the coming years. So, you know, for, for, for the three dimensions, we thought comparably it scored well and high on feasibility. We also thought it was quite innovative to do, you know, social journalism and, and sending people to Europe um, and then bringing um, some insights back. Um, we thought perhaps you can work a little bit more on the, on the impact uh, theory of the whole thing. Um, so you wrote that the, the, the main beneficiaries are the participants, which of course is quite a, a small group. Um, so the question is, um, if those participants then uh, take those insights back into the communities, how will those communities benefit from, from their insights and from their expertise. So that was something we thought perhaps you could look a little bit more into, the, into that. And of course also, um, you probably don't want to have uh, 
privileged youth, you know, traveling to Europe and, and then traveling back, but really look at the diversity of the participants and make sure that you, you know, are inclusive and also have some underprivileged youth that, that take back their, their experiences. So, so looking at the impact and beneficiaries, if you can work that out a little bit more, we think this could be a really interesting uh, project. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, back to Francisca and the last pitch to uh, South Asia. Yeah, if I may say, my personal favorite, such a great pitch. Um, I think I really loved it on all sides because first of all, I think it has so much impact if as a person that feels marginalized, is marginalized, you can find a doctor that you know um, has an, really wants to help you individually personally and has what it takes, has the information, has had the education. So I think impact super high. I think it is super innovative because why doesn't the platform exist yet? I have no idea. Um, and I think it's such a great you know, outcome of such a pitch of the FNF um, to have this uh, proposal and this, uh, this project. I think it's also very feasible because what you're doing is you know that in every country there are some doctors who already provide those services and you have the need for those services and yet there's no connection. And this is what you do. So I think it's super helpful, it's very feasible and super innovative. So I really want to thank you for your pitch and I hope I heard that it's already in progress. I'm very excited about it and I'm very happy to see where it leads you. So thank you very much for the great pitch and I really thought you know, it gave something great to this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to the jury for this impromptu coaching session also that you have uh, provided. Very interesting indeed to hear that constructive feedback. So now, dear guests, it's your turn. You can now choose your favorite if you are here with us live in the room. I do recognize there's an online audience and I'm sorry, but we're going to leave you out of this. Uh, but we are going to ask our audience here in the room to please scan the code that you now see on the screen. That will take you to Mentimeter, to our tool, and you can then vote there for one pitch only, please. You have three minutes to vote. A clock is going to count down the time in just a moment, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off one more time the names and regions of all the pitchers that you see here on stage. So starting here is Nico Stein for Western Europe. Then we have Sorsha Nid Shangali for Southeast and Eastern Europe. Then we have Nabila Arab for the MENA region. For Sub-Saharan Africa, we have Racine Gulizan. Then we have for Southeast Asia, Nourili Rania Jusli. For South Asia, Pragati Singh. For North America, Sophie Hartzman, Holtzman. And for Latin America, Victoria Maria Vanna Feju. So those are the ones that you can vote for one of them. Please start voting now. Can we get our clock activated up here on stage, please? Thank you.
About one minute left on the clock. If you haven't voted yet, you might want to think about clicking. Getting a lot of thumbs up. So, just about down to the last 10 seconds. <laughs> it's like New Year's Eve. <laughs> and the winner is Pragati Singh for South Asia. Congratulations. Congratulations. So, please come forward. And the jury will now present you with the award, which is nice and easy to pack. <laughs> Congratulations. Let's get one with the whole jury as well. And now let's get one with everybody, all of the pictures, all the jury. Congratulations. I'm sure I speak for all of us in the room in wishing each and every one of you the very utmost success. And congratulations on your path from, he, from where you started all the way to Berlin, because all of you are, of course, winners. Thank you. You may take your seats. And our second panel discussion is on strengthening democratic cooperation for the challenges of our time. And we have an outstanding panel with us to review EU ambitions to play a stronger role on the world stage and to explore how Europe is perceived in India, Latin America, and Africa. We'll also be asking what strategic approaches can forge stronger ties with important trade partners in these regions while simultaneously bolstering democratic values. So it's a big topic and I'd like to ask the panelists to now please join me on stage and then I will introduce all of you when you're up here. So. You can take that seat right there, Dr. Hoffmeister, if you would. Sagarika, if you will go over here. Thank you. Then we have um, Madame Poupard. Yeah. yeah. So, hi. You will be right there. Val Valeria, you will be next there. And um, Madame Semou. Oh, okay. You may take that seat. Um, and our hackathon winner, Pragati, is also going to join us. Pragati, are you in the room? You're also going to join our panel, I'm told. So if you'll take this seat right here. And the great thing is that you are now in a wonderful position to watch our conversation with Ivan Krastev, because he's going to be right here on the screen in just a moment. So without further ado, we will backtrack and it is my great honor to introduce an impulse talk by a renowned author and political scientist who has done a great deal of thinking about the topic that we have been discussing, namely about how we can enhance Europe's role as a beacon in the systemic competition between autocracies and democracies. It is a very great honor to welcome the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia and permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Ivan Krastev joins us virtually. Ivan, great to see you. You have the floor.
I'll just ask our technical team, can you give me a nod if, haben wir Herrn Kasse? So we will begin our panel now. Mr. Kostev apparently is not with us yet. And I'll just ask uh, the organization team to give me a thumbs up if we, if we get him online. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our panelists. And I will begin here on uh, the outside left from your point of view. Dear guest, Sagarika Goza writes for leading publications in India, including the Times of India. And she also comments for the news channel ET Now. She's author of a best-selling biography of Indira Gandhi. And she recently published the testimonial, Why I Am a Liberal. Wonderful that you could join us for this panel. Professor Dr. Frank Hofmeister is Director for General Affairs and Chief Legal Officer at the European External Action Service, which is the EU's diplomatic service. Thank you so much for being with us. Isabelle Poupard is Chargée d'Affaires at the Embassy of Canada here in Germany. Welcome to you. Valeria Moy is general director of the economic policy think tank, Mexican Institute for Competitiveness, IMCO, and she's a frequent commentator for Mexican and international print and broadcast outlets. Great that you can be here. Dorothy Semu is Vice Chairperson and Shadow Prime Minister for the Tanzanian Opposition Party Alliance for Change and Transparency, ACT, Wazalendo. And we're very, very pleased that you also could make this uh, trip to join. And our hackathon winner, Pragati Singh, needs no introduction now. <laughs> so welcome. Great that you also are with us. And just a very quick reminder, if I may, because we do have a compact window. We don't know whether Mr. Krastev will join us, so we won't count on those extra 15 minutes yet. But therefore, I'd be grateful if you could keep your answers pretty concise in the first round, perhaps especially concise, and then we can come back to some of the topics that we touch on. And I'd like to begin with the sometimes thorny topic of geopolitics and Europe's relations with the global South. And Frank Hoffman, if I may, I'd, I'd like to start with you. When Ursula von der Leyen took office as president of the EU Commission, she pledged to lead what she called a geopolitical commission in response to uh, the turbulence on the global stage. And now her five-year term is almost over. And I'd like to find out whether you think that the European Commission has in fact become a geopolitical actor in that time, as well as what the biggest potential obstacles are that the EU faces. Thank you very much, uh, dear Melinda and uh, dear guests. It's uh, a great honor for me to speak in this uh, distinguished audience. Uh, let me start uh, being a lawyer by first sketching out a little bit the, the um, procedural basis on which the EU is acting in the world. Um, normally, 
in multilateral relations, it's state's business. And how would the EU then, as an international organization itself, get into the game of the relations between states? And for that, it is important to see that over the years, um, the EU as such has managed to be present in the main multilateral fora. The EU is a member of the WTO. It is an active participant in the UN. Uh, in the last UN General Assembly high-level event, uh, EU commissioners met 130 states. So there is clearly an interest to talk to the EU at the UN. Uh, the EU, together with its member states, are the biggest uh, financial donors in development assistance in the World Bank and so on. And when the G20 and the G7 and the G8 meet, Commission President von der Leyen is there. So on the formal side, the presence is already secured, which shows something. It shows that the other states don't see the European Union as an alien, but want to have it in the room and want to be able to directly communicate to the representative of the union. Um, same on the bilateral level, we have 140 delegations right now accredited throughout the world, EU ambassadors talking with third states directly. And that gives an idea that over the years, indeed, the geopolitics, geopolitics have increased. And if you now ask me, have we been successful in the last five years? Well, probably the answer is a little bit mitigated. Uh, in the eastern uh, neighborhood, Ukraine was discussed at length this morning. But if we look at the southern neighborhood, the North African side, still a very big challenge. Migration, uh, security challenges, uh, the EU policy, the Barcelona policy, is not a huge success, I have to admit. If we look into Africa, um, probably it uh, is uh, a transition phase. I would be interested to hear the, uh, how to say, view of our friends, but traditionally in Africa, the EU is seen as a donor. Please finance our development projects, but less as a political player. And that is in a flux. Uh, it is acknowledged much more. I've been personally in Mozambique in January this year, and uh, all my interlocutors have said, yes, the EU is upgrading. Uh, and we see it much more as a political actor right now. And it has to do also with the fact that there is a big rival out there, China. <laughs> and if we go into Asia and Latin America, probably uh, we are in, in the middle. There are some situations where it's extremely successful and close cooperation. And in some situations, uh, we are still far apart. And you can measure that maybe with the conclusion of trade agreements. Who would have thought that we have a trade agreement with South Korea, with Vietnam, and so on, um, but we still don't have very close trade agreements with India. So there is a mixed picture out there, uh, but it is uh, bound to be improved. And on Latin America, the same. We are very close with Mexico, Chile, and others. But if we look at the uh, transatlantic relationship, there are a lot of challenges remaining. And so I conclude in the first round, yes, the EU is a geopolitical actor, is it successful? Maybe that is mitigated at. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's turn the perspective around now and ask how the EU is perceived from elsewhere, from abroad. And I'll start, if I may, with uh, Sagarika Goza. The Indo-Pacific is now home to more than 50% of the global population. Two-thirds of the world's container trade passes through the shipping lanes in your region. To boost Europe's presence there, the EU adopted a strategy for cooperation with the Indo-Pacific in September 2021. So how present is the EU in people's minds, in the visibility uh, that they experience? Well, Melinda, first of all, thank you so much for having me, and a big thank you to the FNF for inviting me. Uh, the visibility of the EU at the moment in the Indo-Pacific region and within India is not as high as it should be. But I would say that far from, apart from the geopolitical significance of the EU, uh, I think what matters for the EU globally is its moral 
presence. You know, I think the EU, ha EU is the world's conscience keeper. Uh, the EU is the keeper of the democratic flame. And I think in that sense, the EU's presence um, probably uh, belies its, its trade presence, because India has struggled uh, over the last 13 years to, uh, to, uh, uh, to conclude its free trade agreement with the EU. It has not succeeded because of thorny issues like market access and movement for India's professionals. Um, India is uh, pursuing a policy of what I call ruthless pragmatism, which is not get tied up in multilateral forums, but you know, do issue-specific uh, deals with non-permanent partners. And I think, as far as India is concerned, the, 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 the geopolitics, uh, geopolitics of the region is shaped by the rivalry with China. There, the presence of China and the presence of the US looms so large that the EU's presence perhaps does not uh, loom as large as it could, and the visibility of the EU emblem can certainly uh, enhance itself if it ties up much more with cultural exchange projects, if it ties up with uh, uh, trade issues, uh, with you know, welfare uh, measures. But I would say that you know, just on a moral, psychological, and uh, emotional level, India's freedom fighters, I mean, the people who created India, independent India, were incredibly influenced by the European Union. They were incredibly influenced by European countries. Mahatma Gandhi was perhaps one of the world's greatest liberals. He was a great liberal. I think he would have tremendous approval for the FNF's work. So, uh, you know, the uh, ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity are enshrined in our preamble in our constitution. So uh, we look to the EU as uh, the keeper of this liberal democracy, which made India. You know, we were talking earlier off, offline about the fate of democratic countries and dictatorships and economic growth. And there was an amazing, amazingly interesting study in 2019 but done by MIT, uh, Darren uh, Aseglu, who divided the world into democracies and dictatorships and found that when countries exited the dictatorship condition and entered democracy, their GDP actually rose by a fifth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there's, a, there's something to be said for prosperity coming through democratic processes, prosperity coming through the democratic model, through the liberal democratic model, of which the EU is an exemplar. We in India have uh, the example of China, which is not a democracy and very prosperous. So the feeling is that is the model we need to follow. But the EU remains a model of democracy and prosperity, which is why we look to the EU as very visible, very important morally and very salient for us. But strategically uh, and in terms of the mm -hmm. geopolitics of the region, I would say that because of the looming presence of China, we're the visibility of the EU is perhaps not as high as it should be. And we're coming back to China, but let me continue now first with our holding up a mirror to Europe, uh, as it were. And I'll go to Valeria Moy, if I may. The Spanish presidency of the European Union was expected to increase European attention to Latin America. Spain, of course, itself is a major actor there. The European Union did host uh, its first formal dialogue with the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, uh, CELAC, since the first one it's hosted since 2015. But all in all, what would you say the outreach of the EU, how would you rate it toward your region? Is it delivering the kind of connections and results that it could? Thank you, Melinda, and thank you, of course, to the FNF for having me here. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. In a way, I kind of agree with what Sakarika was saying, but in Latin America, we have, instead of China, the U.S. So the presence of the U.S. kind of shadows everybody else's presence. Uh, and that's kind of what's happening with the EU. We see the, EU, the EU as um, kind of a, of a beacon of progress, of what we should aim to. It's kind of aspira aspirational. We should aim to be like them, or we should aim to have some of the things that are very exemplary from some specific countries in the, within the, U, the EU. However, we perceive the EU as two things, very far and stagnant mm -hmm. at this moment in time. It's like. At some point, we need to foster these democratic values and these ideas of prosperity that we don't share with the US, for example. We don't share the ideas of progress or development of the US. 
and we're kind more close to the EU, but we need growth because we're not there yet. We need growth. And then suddenly you start thinking about how China is fostering growth and you have a very complex situation when you need to foster growth, but you need to pursue those democratic values that are, uh, that are exemplary to the EU. So we're seeing things as very complicated from Latin America. We see what's happening in the EU as a very complex topics. We are afraid of what's happening or what's going on with migration in the EU, because we're seeing that in Latin America as well. The movement of people is going incredibly crazy at this moment in time, and we don't know really what to do with it. Um, so we try to see what's going on in Europe, because we see Europe as it has already happened there. So you can take the example from what happened there. But I don't think the presence is as strong as it should be, or as I would love it to be. Thank you so much. And I'll ask Dorothy Samu to comment on that same point, but also particularly um, the, the China part of this, because all major powers are now vying for influence in Africa, and China is often perceived as way out in front, as having successfully positioned itself as a major trading partner and investor and displacing Europe, for example, in large infrastructure projects as well as natural resources. So what advantages is China perceived to offer Com in comparison to Europe. Uh, how do Africans perceive Chinese engagement in, com in contrast? It's on, it'll be on. Uh, thank you so much, Melinda, and thank you for having me. Um, the EU is very well seen in Tanzania and it's regarded as one of the main development partners. However, as you said, now it's facing competition with other geopolitical actors, uh, people who have come to invest, like the Chinese, the Arab, the Turkish. And uh, although uh, the EU is also seen as a, a one of the pillar which protects democracy, but yet these other actors are seen to have a different kind model of democracies. And uh, with Africa, we are awakening, we want to accelerate development, and seeing these other countries with other models of democracies and how they've managed to develop in the sense of what we are seeing. So as they came into our countries, they've been embraced. They are doing also various major projects. And I won't say it's some sort of a competition between the EU and the Chinese, but at the end of the day, what we want is to see development um, accelerating vis-a-vis -vis the disadvantages which are there. Yeah. Would you say, you know, when people are looking toward Europe, is it the economic prosperity side that they mostly see and are interested in, or do the values resonate? Because we have often heard, and perhaps we would have heard from Ivan Krastev today, that the beacon of Europe is dimming. Um, we just heard it's stagnant. Um, how, do, how is it seen in, your, in the African continent? Well, as African countries, we did embrace democracy. But uh, for a long, as long as it, is, uh, it has been, we have not seen much out of it in terms of development. So it seems now we are looking the other side where we see more development, although those people are not embracing uh, democracies. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, whenever there are issues of democracy at the table, we also face the EU more. And compared to the Chinese, which they don't, uh, and the other countries, which they don't really uh, feel or uh, go to, into much into the internal politics or what we believe or not believe in terms of, of democracy. Right. Thank you very much. Pagati, if you will take that microphone. What about young people in your country, but also in the region or elsewhere, uh, if, if you have contacts to peers uh, in other regions of the Global South? What's their view of Europe? How do they see this old continent? Right, thank you for having me. I have to say I'm very underqualified to comment on the geopolitics of EU and the world. Uh, and so I will keep my comments short and sweet and will speak on behalf of a layperson. 
So I think a lot of us seem to underestimate the power of building movements and inspiration from bottom up instead of or in addition to top down. And at the end of the day, public sentiment and public perception is what makes or breaks parties too at the end of the day. And so I have a feeling that EU does not have the same appeal in, in many parts of India in lay people, in young people, in people who consume most of their data from social media and pop culture and do not read reports <laughs> and data and, and research projects. And, and maybe that's, that's a place to look into and see how to make, at the risk of sounding inappropriate, how to make EU look sexy to <laughs> young people. Um, and, and therefore, be able to use those channels to then propagate values of liberalism, democracy, but you first have to make space for that where somebody who does not care about politics would even want to sit and listen. Thank you. I'm seeing the EU Commission posting a TikTok dance. <laughs> Thank you very much. And over to uh, Isabel Poupar, if I may. In 2021, the first summit of democracy took place, bringing together the US, Canada, the EU, and other established and emerging democracies. What potential do you think a forum like that has for promoting global democratic renewal? And what kind of actions um, concretely can and should it take? Mm -hmm. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. Um, Canada has been an active participant in the first two editions of the summit. Uh, so that's a clear indication that we see value in it. Uh, and we look forward to the third edition uh, on which we do not have uh, many details yet, uh, but uh, I understand uh, colleagues in Ottawa are actively uh, involved uh, in actually making sure that uh, this is uh, part of the global uh, discussion in terms of uh, defending uh, democracy. Um, in terms of what Canada has been doing concretely as part of the summit process, uh, we have uh, co-led two of the, uh, what is called, cohorts uh, as part of the, the process. So the one on information integrity and the one on media freedom. Uh, these are two issues the Canadian government uh, cares uh, very much uh, about. Um, and we have you know, uh, a number of initiatives related to these two topics on the international stage. So not only in the context of the summit, uh, of democracies, but also at the UN, at the OSCE, uh, so in other multilateral uh, framework. So in response to your question, the, the, the answer you. is very easy. It's yes, we and see the potential and we'll continue to participate in this process. And that media freedom issue was, uh, we heard profound statements about the importance of media freedom in our earlier panel today, yeah. and that certainly is very much also a bottom-up uh, issue, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. One issue, though, to what degree does a forum like the Summit of Democracy have any measures at all for taking recourse if countries don't live up to their commitments? Is this essentially a toothless paper tiger? Um, that's a tough question because indeed, uh, you know, bodies, institutions uh, like a, a summit uh, have very little means to implement anything. They have no inform uh, enforcement uh, means at their disposal. Uh, and so I think it's based very much on convincing, on reaching out, on engagement. Uh, and this is why uh, the summit, uh, but other international bodies are so important. Um, I think when, uh, you know, it, in the current context, uh, and I can take the example of uh, Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine, uh, you know, we are so convinced that we are right that sometimes we forget to make the argument. And this is what we need to do. And we need to use these forums not only to talk among themselves, but to listen to and to talk to others so as to bring our positions closer. I think this is the real value. Unfortunately, when it comes to enforcement, this is not, uh, I think, the right uh, body. 
One last quick question, if I may, and I recognize that you're a diplomat, so I will not ask you to compliment, comment on developments in your southern neighbor, but clearly popul uh, po populism, polarization, political turbulence there um, are changing the constellation in the transatlantic triangle, as it were, uh, in the relations between North American democracies and Europe. How do yep. you see Canada's role shifting? Um, well, first of all, Canada uh, obviously has uh, a very uh, deep interest uh, in the US, in the evolution of the situation in the US, uh, politically speaking, from a trade point of view. Um, our relationship with the US is an essential one. You know, in terms of how uh, integrated some of our uh, trade supply chains are, uh, in terms of how many times uh, portions of a car have to cross the border before the car eventually emerges. Um, and so uh, for us, uh, the relationship with the US is a essential, vital one. That's why we need to talk to the US, we need to engage with the US at all levels. And this is what we do. Uh, this is what we have done during the first Trump presidency. Uh, whoever wins the next election, we will have no choice but to talk to. You know, This is part of our interests. Uh, and I think it's in the interest of the US also to continue to engage with Canada. It's a mutually beneficial relationship. Thank you very much. I won't delve into the meaning of first Trump presidency. <laughs> I want to go over now, if I may, to uh, Frank Hofmeister to talk a little bit about some concrete initiatives uh, that we are seeing in the trade and economic realm, partly driven by concerns about China and its outreach. So the EU introduced the Global Gateway Connectivity Strategy, and clearly this is partly a response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, which has been a powerful outreach tool for China. How do you assess the success of the EU initiative? Yeah, thanks, uh, Melinda, for um, going into the specifics now of uh, trade and e e economic relations. Uh, let me first uh, state that in Brussels, after the uh, war of aggression against Ukraine, there was a quite an internal reflection what to do next in terms of outreach. And the outcome is uh, that, um, not surprisingly, bureaucratic talk, there is an action plan. <laughs> so an action plan of outreach, and the parameters of that is that the EU wants to step up uh, the relations with key partners in three areas. Based on partnership and a human-centric approach, it's trade, digital and energy transition, and infrastructure investments through Global Gateway. So maybe I can then underpin that with an example each. On trade, we have the traditional instrument of concluding free trade agreements, which are coupled with conditionality. So we have a human rights conditionality and a sustainable development conditionality. And that already shows sometimes the limits of the approach. I'll give you an example. Sustainable development conditionality meant in the area of South Korea that we had a discussion with South Korea, do you protect the freedom of association of labor unions or not? And it became a matter under a free trade agreement between the EU and South Korea how the degree of this coalition freedom is guaranteed. And there's even a panel which said, Korea, you're not good enough. You have to improve that. That was a successful example. On the other hand, we have language we try to get in sustainable development with Mercosur. And there, we are stuck. Because Mercosur countries say, look, we don't want you to tell us what is our deforestation policy. It goes too far. And that's why we don't even have a free trade agreement yet. So that's maybe an example with the two sides. And going to Global Gateway, Global Gateway in, is correctly a response to the Chinese uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. And what we offer to partners is to say, look, we can pull a lot of money into joint infrastructure projects, which we identify. 
and then we bring it out from there. And the first examples are encouraging. We have recently seen that Egypt agreed that uh, 2,000 kilometers of train should be built by Siemens. We have an initiative with India, the IMEC, India uh, Middle East Cor Corridor, just recently decided in the G20. There will be a summit in two weeks, the Global Gateway Summit, and I'm not going to predict how many heads of states will show up, but this will be more than one digit. So just saying the, the train is ongoing. I cannot already tell you, wow, everything is super and fine, but it's clear that uh, Europe has understood it has to step up its effort on all these areas and tries to put in a counterweight to Chinese influence in the region. And is there conditionality on those infrastructure projects as well? No, uh, because on the infrastructure projects, it's absolutely clear if you look about linking, uh, for example, IMEC, if you want to link India with the EU and going to the Gulf Cooperation countries, you are not going to tell all these governments and first you have to make a democratic reform because then you have no project at all. Uh, so right. uh, uh, okay. it is, that, is, that is the reality. Um, but at the same time, of course, the EU is counting that its way of dealing with the infrastructure projects and the follow-up. So who is going to build them? Are there specific, uh, how to say, payback mechanisms and so on? That Europe is, has a much more liberal offer than the Chinese, mm -hmm. and that is soft power. But it's not, that's not a precondition. Sagarika, if you would, um, let's talk a little bit about countering Chinese influence, uh, because clearly um, the Indian and Western, the Western and European outreach to India, which has been quite intensified uh, in recent months, is very much about doing just that. Um, so China's Belt and Road Initiative now does touch pretty much every country in South Asia. How important is it that that influence be countered? And what tools do you think are most effective for that purpose? That's a very good question, Melinda. I think China is India's you know, gargantuan, militarist, imperialist rival. It is the giant of Asia. It is aggressive. It is territorially expansionist. It makes no apology for its one-party state. Uh, it is not democratic. It exports the non-democratic model of prosperity. Uh, and it is uh, literally everywhere. I mean, I think the Chinese juggernaut is, uh, you know, steamrollering across the globe. And it is a real and present danger for India's territorial integrity, because China has actually encroached into India's border villages, and, and there are reports that India has actually, uh, China has actually taken over vast tracts of Indian land. Uh, so I think the way to counter Chinese influence is what the Indian government is doing, uh, which is pursuing a kind of ruthless pragmatism in tying up as many alliances as it can. Those are the tools it's using. For example, as uh, as uh, uh, you know, as Frank mentioned, the um, uh, G20 summit which was uh, held and very much tried to bolster India's regional standing. The Quad initiative, the Quad countries, including India, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, then there is the, uh, the, uh, the, the G20, the Quad, the BRICS, which has just uh, included the, uh, the Aust African Union in it. The idea is that the African Union should be weaned away from the Chinese and into the forums that India is, a, is presently uh, involved with, such as the G20. So this G20 summit in, in New Delhi, as you know, offered a seat to the African Union. Uh, the reason why India has taken the stand it has on the Ukraine war, when it would make sense for India to line up with the liberal democracies, India being the world's largest democracy, 1.4 billion people under democracy, is, I believe, a global good. And so India's democracy needs to be kept alive, and the EU should export a democracy. I know this sounds interventionist, it sounds neocon, it sounds, you know, that you're intervening in, in areas which are may not be, you know, in the Western frame of mind, but, you know, Democratic values need to survive, liberal values need to survive, and the EU needs to build these conditionalities into relations with the Global South. Now, the way to counter the Chinese influence, I believe, is through the soft power of democracy, is through the soft power of uh, 
that prosperity can be achieved through democratic means, and also, of course, the you know, hard realities of tying up alliances on multilateral levels, the, the multilateral world, as it is, as India is aiming for. And um, also, I would say that you know, a kind of psychological pressure can be built on China through initiatives like the India-Middle East Corridor, uh, which, propose, which is kind of an answer to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is creating a corridor from India to the Middle East. Uh, India's relationship with the United States is another pressure that can be built on China. I mean, India is at the moment the flavor of the month, right? Right. So let, uh, me ask, let me ask you about the flavor of the month because the, the flavor is often the flavor is often presented as like-minded countries, yes. the world's biggest democracy, as you say. But a number of things are happening in. India that are not democratic. And, no. um, you know, if I look at India's ongoing trade relations with Russia, it's, uh, it's very clear refusal to condemn yes. the Russian yes. invasion of Ukraine. I find myself wondering how like minded are India and Europe? Super question. Uh, I have to say, Melinda, you know, you're a journalist, I'm a journalist. At the moment in India, there are 17 journalists charged under terrorism laws. Seven of them are in jail. Journalism is being conflated with terrorism. Uh, it's being seen as criminal activity against the state, when our job is to question the state. Uh, there is a surveillance and censorship apparatus being built in India. There are civil society activists who continue to be in prison. The, uh, uh, the judiciary, uh, often there are questions asked about the independence of the judiciary. Uh, there is a huge assault on religious minorities. Uh, religious zealotry and religious majoritarianism is the flavor of the month in India. If you open the, the, the mainstream TV channels, all you would see are religious debates. I know that Pragati uh, knows this. I mean, it's like, you know, if, if you opened up television channels in the EU and kept seeing Catholics and Protestants battling it out every day on television, you know? It's like that. It's like Hindus and Muslims battling it out every, every day on television. So India's democratic backsliding, I believe, is a global catastrophe. Mm -hmm. It is a global calamity because there are so many people living under this uh, de democratic system. And, you know, uh, the democracy needs to survive in India. India was a British colony for 200 years. After we exited uh, the colonial uh, regime and became independent, India is now the fastest growing economy in the world. India is uh, going to be the third largest economy in the world by 2028, overtaking Germany and Italy. So, you know, that says a lot for democracy, right? Democracy has to function for these 1.4 billion people. It's brought them prosperity. It's brought them more than they realize. But what has happened now is that the democratic idea is not fashionable anymore. Mm -hmm. Somehow people seem to be, you know, bored. Dem democracy is about elite liberals in their seminar rooms, carrying out elite uh, you know, discussions about things they don't understand. Democracy is not about strong men leaders, you know, giving all the razzle-dazzle and, you know, settling things with one wave of the hand. Somebody's coming riding in a white horse. He's so, sort, sorting everything out. Me, and, you know, I mean, that is this electoral autocracy, which has gripped the world, has also gripped India, mm -hmm. which is why I say that there is not the kind of commonality of values that needs to exist between India and the EU, and the EU should push for it. And because... we're going to come back to how it can do yeah. that. But let me go to uh, Dorothy Semu now, because those relations between India and Russia have a parallel in your country uh, in relations with Turkey. Turkey's influence and presence in Tanzania is quite strong, and it ranges from trade and bilateral relations to military cooperation. How is Turkey perceived in Tanzania compared to Europe? Is there recognition, let's say, among citizens more broadly that they stand for very different things? Uh, well, I believe um, um, Tanzanians uh, see Turkish as uh, business people, people who have come to work with them. And uh, fortunately, I think Turkey does not uh, interfere in any of the political issues. So at the same time, it has managed to get a lot of government tenders, infrastructure activities. At the same time, there's a lot of uh, transfer of skills uh, through their companies, through their investments. So it's like 
the common person who is looking for a job, he will always welcome them since they're getting skills, they're getting jobs, and they're seeing that it's working for them. The businessmen are getting more trade. We are trading more with Turkey, more um, uh, better goods, um, especially on the construction side. Uh, so there are people who are welcomed as businessmen, as partners, and not much as a threat to any or anything as far as we can see. Yeah. Thank you very much. In light of all that you are telling us, let me ask you, and for me this is perhaps the central question of this panel, to what degree in this current geopolitical climate with concern about China's rise uh, shaping so much of what Europe, North America are doing, to what extent should democratic values drive EU outreach? And how do you see the balance between those on the one hand and economic and political interests on the other? And let me get Valeria, if you would, to comment first on that. Do we essentially tie our own hands by you know, putting conditionality into trade agreements and by saying, well, you know, yes, we want to work with you, but you need to do this, this, and this first? Um, well, I do think that conditionality is working. Uh, in Mexico, the US and Canada, we have, as you might all know, a very important trade agreement, and it's loaded with conditionality. And actually, for example, it has a whole chapter on corruption practices. Of course, uh, they were aimed at Mexican procurement system, but it works for the three countries. Um, and it was the first trade agreement that actually included a whole chapter on how to tackle corruption together. So that's kind of a condition. And now it's working, that condition. In, the, in this trade agreement, we have a conditionality on labor unions, and it's working. Uh, this is a new, it was a new clause that it was cited just at the end of the negotiations, and actually it's not a trilateral clause. It only applies basically to the US towards Mexico, but actually it's working. And that's conditionality. We have conditionality regarding SMEs, and it's working slowly. That clause regarding conditionality is very slow in its, in its works, but I think it might, uh, it might be of use in the following years. We have even conditionality on gender issues in our free trade agreement. So I do think conditionality works if, they, if it is implemented correctly. What I think it's more important than the conditionality clause or the conditionality idea is that each country has to see the European Union's uh, cooperation as that, as cooperation and not as intervention. Because as Dr. Helfmeister was mentioning, sometimes it's very difficult to accept help or to accept ideas or to accept different thoughts or different ways of being if you consider it that they're intervening, not only with your politics, but with your way of seeing things. And I think that's a very thin line, and it's very complicated to walk, but we need to walk it. So we, from the Latin America part, um, I think we need cooperation, we need aid, we need discussion of ideas, we need democracy, we need, because you might think that the discussions that you have in Europe are the same discussions that we have in Latin America, and they are not. So in in, here in Berlin, we're having this very interesting discussion about democracy. In Mexico, we're discussing completely different things. We're discussing security, we're discussing trade, we're discussing the following elections, we're discussing a very authoritarian president, and what's going to happen with the next president? Is she, because she's going to be a woman, is she going to be as authoritarian as this one is? So. Sometimes democracy is not at the core of our discussions. Maybe it should be, but we have so many issues to tackle that democracy sometimes just lays in the back of our head. So Europe might help. I think it's important for them to help, for you to help, but in a way of cooperation, not of intervention. Are you concerned that with the rise of authoritarianism in many Latin American countries that the space for conditionality to have the influence that you've described is shrinking? It is shrinking, of course it is. Uh, all, all throughout Latin America you see this authoritarian 
um, regimes rising, it's a very weird thing that we have all the benefits, well, maybe not all the benefits, but some benefits of democracy, many benefits of free trade agreements, and we tend towards these authoritarian leaders, not only regimes, leaders, because it's kind of a personal thing. We, we try to see people as leaders. And I think that's very worrisome. In Mexico, currently, regarding, for example, corruption, just the president declared that there's no corruption anymore whatsoever. So how can you tackle corruption if there's no corruption anymore? And how do you tackle other issues if they're non-existent? Just because the president said so. So it's becoming increasingly difficult in that space. It's indeed shrinking. Isabel Poupard, the, I'd like to shift us a little bit to talk quite concretely about free trade agreements. And I'll start, if I may, with uh, CETA, with the EU-Canada Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. It came into force provisionally in 2017 the following two years saw a 4.5% increase, in, increase in the volume of trade. Can CETA, do you think, be a blueprint for other FTAs, and why did the negotiation and ratification process take so long? It was an arduous process. Why? Yes. Um, well, the answer to your first question is a big yes. Of course, CETA can serve as a blueprint. Uh, CETA is a progressive agreement. It has very high standards included when it comes to labor standards, environmental standards. Um, and so uh, this is something we have been very much uh, promoting as such. Um, as you mentioned, it uh, entered into provisional application in 2017. Uh, what that means concretely is that basically 97% of the agreement was implemented, is implemented, even though as of now, only 17 out of 27 EU members have actually ratified CETA. Uh, of course, Canada did a long time ago. Um, but the agreement is, for all purpose, in effect. It is working. Uh, I will not bore you with all kinds of you know, numbers and statistics, um, but what I have in front of me is that uh, since it entered into force, uh, provisionally again, uh, the uh, bilateral trade in goods between uh, Canada and the EU is up 54% compared to pre-CETA levels. Uh, and so this is quite an achievement. Uh, I think it's very important for us. Now, why do we continue to seek actual ratification? It is because it sends a very important signal about the trust, trust in Canada and the EU being important partners, being important trade partners, but also being strategic partners based on a, a set of common values. Um, I think in the case of the German ratification, uh, the international context helped us. Uh, this was uh, shortly after uh, Russia's invasion, and uh, it brought, in a way, our argument about, uh, if not with Canada, with whom, suddenly a very specific focus. Uh, that was a good thing, and I'm very happy that uh, the German parliament has ratified CETA. Now, why did it take so long to negotiate it? Well, CETA, it's not a 20-page agreement, you know? I, I, I've, have any of you have seen yes. CETA? You know, it's that it's thick. Yes. Uh, so it takes a long time to negotiate. And then why does it take so long to ratify? Of course, I, I cannot comment in details on the you know, internal situation of individual EU countries. Uh, but clearly, each parliament has its own dynamics. Uh, sometimes it is more complicated. Sometimes there are alliances, there are trade-offs. Uh, this, is, if I may say, is part of the game. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we will cease seeking ratification in all EU countries. That remains the objective. At the same time, are we nervous about it? No. We are confident it will happen, and in the meantime, CETA continues to be implemented at 97%. 
So, so Frank, clearly the EU has two different kinds of beacon effect for other countries. One is economic, the other one is moral, ethical, political, the d democracy part. So I want to drill deeper on l linking or not linking the two of those, um, and particularly through trade agreements, but because we've just talked about how difficult it was to get to yes on CETA. If we add more political conditionality into trade agreements, we only complicate that very, very complex, long, painstaking process. So how wide is it to try to leverage this economic side, the trade uh, attractiveness of the EU uh, in order to nudge our trading partners toward more democracy? Yeah, thanks, Melinda. And uh, uh, maybe I allow myself a little legal digression first before going into the politics. Uh, so what uh, um, uh, Isabel has uh, explained was uh, we took so long because in this situation it's not only the European Parliament which ratifies, but all national parliaments on top of it. And that's a little bit of an anomaly because normally the EU is responsible for trade, full stop. Member states as such do not have to be there and that's what we lawyers call a mixed agreement, the EU plus all the 27. And the lesson learned from the CETA saga was that we asked the European Court of Justice, is that really necessary? And the European Court of Justice in a Singapore opinion said, no, you can conclude a trade agreement as EU only. The only thing where you need member states on top is investment protection. That is why since 2017, the new architecture of agreements is we do it as EU only, and if there is investment, then we need all 27 member states, and then we need all those national ratifications. So the good news is we learned a lesson from that. Now, coming back to your question on the uh, political conditionality, does it, does it overload the trade agreements or not? On this one, I have to say, from Brussels' perspective, there are standard clauses, and standard clauses are on human rights. So with every trade partner, irrespective of whether it's a democracy or not, we would say you need to make sure that the basic standards of human rights will be respected and at least not retrograded. Yeah? So if you're not perfect human rights protector, at least you're not going to get worse. And that's a standard clause applied to everybody and is accepted also by everybody. The other thing is sustainable development. That goes into social and environmental uh, matters. And there it is much more complicated uh, to fine tune how far do you go and the Brussels approach is to say, usually, you know what? We both agree that sustainable development is important and we will make sure that the international commitments that you have taken so if you sign Paris Agreement, we are going to watch whether you really implement the Paris Agreement as a matter of our trade policy. And this is, how to say, accepted. It reflects what Valeria has said, a cooperative approach. We are not going to dictate to you new commitments, but it's a joint interest to see that we are really implementing. And that, I would think, is a good way forward. Last observation, there's not only trade agreements, meaning a free trade treaty, but in many parts of the world, we can also offer trade concessions unilaterally. For example, many African states would like to export to the European Union and say, but you know what, a trade agreement we don't need now. But why don't you open up your market autonomously, freely? Because we are a developing country, we need those market access. And there the EU usually says, yes, we can do that. This is, we give general system of trade preferences for free. And then the EU can add up additional conditions and say, look, if you want to have even more trade uh, market access, we can give you even better conditions if you protect human rights and democracy and so on. And that's what we call GSP+. Plus. Mm -hmm. And in this kind of situation, we have a leverage 
And I can give you a recent example, Cambodia. Cambodia rece received GSP plus treatment, so very good market access for their exports for free. But when the government basically abolished uh, uh, fair elections, the EU said, sorry, that's not going to, to be tolerated. We are going to retreat that additional concessions. And that is an important instrument which we, which we I think, in this discussion should also keep in mind. Thank when, you. Before you put the microphone down, just, um, you know, perhaps to drill a little bit deeper, the yeah. EU Commission's trade chief uh, said yeah. not too long ago, I'm quoting, Europe needs reliable trade partners, which does not mean like-minded. Yeah. So is she essentially acknowledging that realpolitik interests are now becoming more important in this picture? and some of that linkage to social and political topics more difficult? Um, I think we, we couldn't distinguish between two questions. The one is, with whom do we negotiate? So the selection of the trade partners. And the other question is, if we trade with somebody, what are we going to put in the text? And on the first question, I would say it is certainly preferable to reach out to democracies and rule of law states. But you cannot have trade with important parts of the world if this is an exclusion criterion. Otherwise, we would exactly run into your question, shall we now trade with India in a situation where they're sliding back or not? So it cannot be a selection criteria. But once you go into trade negotiations also with less democratic states, then you can say, look, we have certain standards and these needs to be complied with. I think there, there, there is a, a trade-off to, to be made and maybe uh, Commission President von der Leyen was talking on the first one to say, we also have to make trade with non-democracies. Thank you. Let me now ask um, all of the uh, representatives on the panel of Global South Regions to talk a little bit about where you see opportunities for expanded socio-economic connections with Europe. And I'd, I'd like to ask you, Pogatti, for your generation, what would be the single most important socio-economic topic or issue that you think the EU could make a difference on? I don't think I have a single answer for that. There's really so many things, but I would say largely human rights and human rights violations are things that me and a lot of people that I work with, civil society organizations, care about immensely, especially in this day and age, especially in my country, in India, uh, where we had them, and then it seems like they're slipping away, and so it's become even more important for us right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So not in the interest here, but really getting back to the value side. Thank you. If I can go to Valeria to talk a little bit about uh, trade agreements uh, with your region. Uh, clearly, we've got a litmus test uh, coming up now in terms of uh, strategic partnership, both in the form of finalizing uh, pending agreements uh, like Mercosur, but also the association there at the moment. And what would be the impact of these agreements? We ourselves as part of the Global South. <laughs> We see ourselves as part of, we are of North America, so we're kind of in the middle of it. Um, every single day, 4.5 billion. So it is what it is. Numbers are there, reality is there. Uh, I was talking yesterday and so when we look at, Lat uh, when we take a look at Latin America and the a lot of trade agreements, or not trade agreements, but trade real. We do not trade with China. Opportunities in a very important moment in time. I think uh, Pragati was talking about human rights things, more related to information and to sharing of information. India, what do you think is most important to unlock the untapped potential that's there? And how, if at all, can that be forged as a linkage with some of the human rights and social and political themes that we, we're talking about. Right. Uh, Melinda, I don't think it's either or. Uh, it's not, you know, economy on one side and democracy and moral messaging on the other. I think the two have to go together. Democracy is good for growth. Uh, democratic institutions are good for growth. They've 
that, that's been proved in India. Uh, it's been proved worldwide. It's been proved in the EU. And I think that's the kind of message that the EU can take to India. Uh, there are tremendous complementarities, tremendous complementarities between EU and India in terms of trade. We have, for the last over a decade, been trying to create a free trade agreement. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, tapping into each other's uh, complement complementary areas. Um, the EU is worried about India's tariff barriers. Uh, India is worried about the movement of professionals. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's been uh, the, the EU-India trade uh, volume is over $70 billion. Uh, the EU is India's largest, third largest trading partner. So there's a tremendous uh, uh, complementarity that can be achieved. Uh, Mr. Ursula von der Leyen uh, recently announced the Trade and Technology Committee the TTC between India and the EU, which is capitalizing on digital strategies, on uh, you know, uh, technological uh, cooperation. So uh, there are tremendous, there's tremendous potential in this relationship. There's tremendous economic potential in this relationship. India's churning out half a million IT engineers every year. You know, uh, the idea is how to get them jobs. India wants market, you know, wants its professionals, wants its highly skilled professionals to be able to move around in the EU. The EU wants India to lessen its tariff barriers and bring down tariffs on uh, spirits, on, uh, you know, edible items, etc. So there are lots of nitty gritties to be worked out in this free trade agreement. But I think if it's ever done, if it ever comes to fruition, it'll be a huge comprehensive game changer for both the India and the EU. EU. Would you say that in uh, this current geopolitical climate, the EU yes. has leverage that it can use? Or do you think that Modi is saying to himself, you know, I can basically dictate my terms because they, they just really need me so badly? Well, Mr. Modi is really the global favorite at the moment, isn't he? He's, uh, he's being fated in the US, fated in uh, France, I think uh, fated across Europe and in the world. So uh, he really is, you know, someone who is in a sweet spot. <laughs> He's in the right place at the right time. India's the good guy. China's the bad guy. And in Asia, India's the good democratic guy, the big good democratic guy. But the thing is, how do we keep India democratic? And I think that uh, that's somewhere, that's a place where really the EU needs to be, uh, you know, predicated on this belief that uh, democracy is good for business. Democracy is good for openness. Democracy is good for growth. And I think. I think Mr. Modi is tremendously self-confident about his uh, role in the world. I think he sees himself as an aspirational global leader. Uh, and I think that, uh, but I think the EU is too important and too morally salient for anyone to ignore. The EU is, you know, the EU commands a lot of moral heft. You know, the EU is the land of uh, demo de where democracy was born. The EU is uh, the land of, liberty, equality, fraternity. So the EU's moral messaging, as well as the attractive trade terms it can offer India, means that Mr. Modi can't dismiss the EU's concerns and can't dismiss the EU on, okay. uh, on conditionalities, which I think, uh, as you know, Dr. Hofmeister was saying, I know that the conditionalities are difficult to pin into an economic relationship. But if we go by the dictum that democracy is good for business, democracy is good for growth, then we need democracy for economics, right? It's not either or. We need the democracy to get the trade. We need the democracy to get the economy going. We need the democracy for market access. We need the democracy to uh, not crimp the human potential of billions of people. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we have democracy as a kind of engine driver of the economy, then why don't we, why can't we push for that more in uh, trade negotiations? Frank, you had a comment. Yeah, I, I would like to, to add that um, there is also a question of in, internal EU openness about um, one of the crucial demands you have rightly mentioned. So uh, unfortunately, the negotiations are more than 10 years old. Yes. And I can tell you an anecdote from 10 years when uh, the United Kingdom was still a member of the European Union. The then Prime Minister Cameroon <coughs> told the then Trade Commissioner de Rucht, look, you have to do everything to get the India FTA during your mandate closed, okay? It was very clear. And then the Trade Commissioner answered to him, Mr. Cameroon, how many Indian IT specialists are you willing to accept and give a visa into the UK? <laughs> 
And the answer was silence. <laughs> so I, just to give you an idea, it's not only on Modi's side, it's also on the EU side, it's difficult. We have to move if we want to have a, a trade relationship based on equality. Thank you. That's uh, based on equality is a great bridge to what I would like to ask Dorothy Semu because the EU, in fact, has negotiated a series of economic partnership agreements, EPAs, with 48 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. The majority of these are seeing trade patterns where the African countries essentially send to the EU primary goods, food, drink, maybe energy. The EU sends to them higher valued manufactured products. In other words, it's not a relationship based on equality. It's an imbalanced relationship. And you told us what you think is crucial is that the EU be seen as a cooperation partner but not as interventionist or, I suppose, neo-colonial. So how do we change that? Well, I think we need a win-win situation when we work with Africa, and we also need to debunk um, uh, that uh, the colonial mind, the colonial setting that Africa now is still exporting raw materials to Europe. Uh, we need to empower, ensure that Africa is a uh, 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 supported in such a way that now it also can produce and sell uh, finished goods to the European Union and other areas. So to me, uh, as an opportunity, a socioeconomic opportunity, we believe maybe EU can support more SMEs, can at the same time, we uh, want to see them uh, uh, African thriving economically, at the same time seeing democracy thriving. So apart from the SMEs, we can also support the civil organizations to act as uh, pillars and protectors of democracy. Thank you, and, and I want to ask you a follow-up question um, about energy, because of all the topics in geopolitics uh, at the moment, energy looms very, very large as an area where, uh, as you know, Europe has been scrambling to find cooperation partners uh, in Africa, in Latin America, really across the globe to make up for weaning itself off of Russian gas. So is there untapped energy potential for, for trade between the EU and Africa? And if so, how do you think that can best be structured? Thank you, Melinda. Uh, Africa has a lot of untapped energy. Uh, my country has a lot of gas, uh, untapped wind energy. And at the same time, not much has been done to invest, uh, first for local use and maybe for external uh, use, even exporting uh, energy. So investing in those areas would bring a positive uh, revenue to the country and also enable the country to have enough energy for its own. Uh, at the moment, we are also experiencing energy cuts. We don't have enough you know, of electricity. We have a lot of gas. We cannot even uh, support uh, basic industries in the country. So investment, investment, uh, starting with the Africans themselves, benefited, benefiting from those investments and exporting the energy. And Sagarika said to us, you know, democracy is good for business. Democracy is good for development. Um, in the energy area, the resource curse has meant that that is a sector where often um, corruption and bad governance are absolutely rampant. Do you see a way that these energy partnerships can be devised and, and uh, shaped so that we see the use of the windfall profits that are often derived from energy and natural resources going toward the people? Yes, and uh, uh, um, we can have uh, uh, contracts, investments, uh, which ensure that there is lesser corruption. But at the same time, if you don't have a good uh, thriving democracies, it is very delicate to ensure that you won't have uh, corruption, to ensure that you'll have good governance in those projects. Uh, we are 
a good example of where investments have been done, especially in the mining sector, and we are facing that resource cars, that there are profits coming out of the same place, but in the same area, people who are living there don't have the basic needs. So I think they should go together, have good contracts, at the same time, have guiding principles so that we have good governance and ensure that there's lesser and lesser corruption. And energy, also a big topic in relations with Latin America, uh, Valeria, the uh, uh, great hopes that you could become a source of critical materials uh, for much needed uh, renewable energy projects and also that in that way uh, essentially deliver some friendshoring benefits for the EU. Uh, how do you think the EU can secure a reliable, sustainable supply without returning to this kind of purely extractive relation? That's exactly the point. In, in, at least in Mexico, we're seeing, or at least the president, seeing private investment in the energy sector as an extraction uh, of, of rents. I completely disagree, by the way, but this is the way the president has handled his, his uh, energy policy. And everybody in Mexico is just hoping and thinking that with the next term, things might change, especially regarding renewables, because public resources are not enough to foster renewables. So we need, the country needs private investments. I think everybody's very clear on that except the current president. Uh, so we're just hoping, what worries me is that we're losing time. We're just wasting time, you know, wasting time, very valuable time, um, because Mexico is full. It's, it, the potential that Mexico has regarding renewables is just exorbitant. And we need investment to get there. Not only, not only for, so we're just waiting good development and it takes a lot of our own energy of the uh, major Canada, Ontario could and uh, thanks to a, a very innovative geothermal technology uh, will provide heating to 20,000 uh, then another one in uh, Magdeburg uh, is actually doing uh, the recycling of electric vehicle uh, lithium batteries will be recycled per year uh, that has also to be part of the equation. You know, it's not only about getting new raw material or critical minerals, it's also about recycling and making a better use of what we have. And I think that is also very uh, important as part of the overall equation. And there, I, I must admit, uh, Canada and Germany are really, uh, you know, partners, like dream partners. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sounds very romantic. <laughs> Let me just go back to Frank to talk a little bit about the energy context. With the big development banks, uh, World Bank, but also I think to some degree EIB and EBRD, they are using uh, their safeguards essentially to ensure that when they finance a big infrastructure or energy project, there are some governance requirements associated with that, whether it's including indigenous peoples uh, in discussions or expropriation protection or uh, funds established uh, to ensure that there are local benefits. Would you say that that is something that we can still allow ourselves in the current geopolitical climate? Um, or, as is often said of the World Bank, given the fact that the AIB is moving right ahead without any safeguards, that we need to be, again, more pragmatic? That's a, um, a tough nut. Um, uh, first point, um, I think we sh all agree that um, climate change is a global issue. So we need to work with all countries around the world, irrespective of their political system. That's why uh, the EU also has a climate diplomacy. So we reach out also to countries with whom we otherwise don't have too much in common, because without China, uh, you will not save the world climate. Um, that's a starting point. But then again, um, how do you then practically cooperate? Will you put money on the table uh, for a partner for whom you know that some of the benefits will not arrive at the right place? 
or even worse in the situation of China, which may use its market power to destroy other uh, basically legitimate industry. Here in Germany, we have seen the solar panel industry it was very strong in Eastern Germany. And after years of Chinese dumping, it was basically destroyed. So you have to ask this follow-up questions very seriously. And um, coming back to your initial question on EIB, I think the European Commission has a vote in the EIB. We can somehow influence this. Uh, the questions have been put on the table, whether one should not be stricter. Um, but I cannot tell you that this is now a complete policy change. But uh, I think the sensitivity has grown that not only the objective to have as much climate uh, cooperation as possible, but also the way on how you design it needs to respect our values. And I think this is an open question right now, how to do it in particular in, in donor uh, practice. Thank you very much. And maybe I will let Pragati um, close our panel with um, the mention of climate diplomacy. And we heard that as an interest among some of the other hackathon um, winners um, in the pitches. You told us human rights is one way to reach young people uh, in your country. What about climate? Are climate issues uh, of the kind of importance they are for many young people here? And would you say that the EU, as perhaps one of the strongest climate actors in the world, is that an area of resonance? Thank you for that question. Again, climate is not an area of interest to me personally, but I know that it's, it's caught up a lot of attention recently in, in India, in South Asia, in, in many parts of the world. And, and I feel like one of the things that I want to mention is that, of course, we talk about climate and climate issues as a global issue. But we also need to constantly stay cognizant of the fact um, of who is paying the price and who is probably causing the most burden um, while we talk about climate change. And I feel like in India, there's a lot of cognizance of that, more than there would be may maybe in other parts of the world. Um, so I do think that climate change right now is a very appealing topic uh, for, for good reason. Um, and, and that would definitely be a place of exchange knowledge transfer and support that you could provide. I can see it. Thank you very much. Let's give our panel a very warm round of applause for this very thoughtful discussion. I, I think we've heard some very valuable insights on how Europe is perceived in other regions of the world, and also certainly about how we can cooperate in the effort that was so eloquently depicted in the film that we saw earlier on, namely the fight for freedom and the effort to reinvigorate the democratic beacon. So many thanks to all of you for this. You may take your seats again, because we are now going to hear closing words. And it is my... It is my great honor for that purpose to hand over to the former president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and the former president of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. She is a tireless campaigner for human and civil rights. She serves as a member of the board of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. A very warm welcome to you, Anne Brasseur. The floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as we bring this interesting conference to close, let me first, on behalf of the Naumann Foundation, thank all those who gave us insights in different topics. And there we could witness once more how complex, how complicated it is. And I want to extend my thanks to uh, our uh, guest speaker, Mr. Oleski Makayev, the ambassador of Ukraine uh, to Germany. Well, we know why he had to leave, because he has other things to do. But I think it was important to have his witnesses and to, to have also the other panelists to tell him how strong we are supporting Ukraine, because Ukraine is Europe, and it's also about 
our peace and uh, about our uh, freedom. So thank you very much uh, to uh, this uh, guest speaker we, uh, we had this morning. And um, referring to that panel, it's very difficult to make a conclusion uh, today, but referring to that panel, I want to refer to uh, Mrs. Schatz Zimmermann, the uh, German member of the uh, Bundestag, who is the president of the uh, Defense Committee. And she said, we need too much time for all our decisions. What we need is decisions now to help Ukraine now. And that's what we have really to do Going back home, if there is a need, we need to take decisions, and uh, that is uh, Im important. I also want to thank all the panelists uh, who came from afar uh, to tell us about the differences, how Europe is perceived. And if you talk about Europe, usually it's referred to the EU, but having a past in the Council of Europe, regrouping the geographical Europe, that means 46 member states. Uh, Russia is no longer a member because they excluded themselves uh, uh, finally. But those 46 member states all belong to the geographical Europe. So there are four countries. The geographical Europe has 50 countries. Four countries are not members. Russia which excluded itself. Uh, Belarus uh, was never a member because they still implement death penalty and that's not acceptable uh, for uh, the organization of the Council of Europe. Kosovo, because of the conflict that we heard uh, today uh, from uh, Serbia, how difficult it, it is, and a very small state the Vatican, which really is not a democracy. Nobody can uh, tell it is one. So, but we have 50 uh, countries, so 46 are in the Council of Europe. And they all are linked by the European Convention on Human Rights. And in the past, many, many years ago, political leaders told me, well, um, you have Western values, and we have traditional values. I said, listen, we all share the same values and they are enshrined in that European Convention for Human Rights with its guardian, the uh, European Court for Human Rights. Unfortunately, those decisions of the court very often are not implemented by countries. For instance, Russia didn't implement them. And, uh, in the Parliamentary Assembly, I asked a question to Mr. Lavrov, the Minister of Foreign Affairs from Russia, and I had the figures. I said, why don't you implement those decisions of the court? And he, he just answered, well, those are political uh, decisions. We only implement the legal ones. And that shows the big difference which are there in the perception. Another. Uh, and I want to talk to you in my concluding remarks from my personal experience. I took over the presidency of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in January 2000, uh, 2014, just before the annexation of Crimea by Russia. And then I, I still believe in, in, in dialogue, in diplomacy, so uh, I talked to, to uh, the president of the Verkhovna Rada, the parliament of Ukraine. I talked to the president of the Duma, and I went to the Duma. I invited the president of the Duma. He came to Strasbourg. And then uh, we, had it, we had a press conference, and I said, we must keep the channels of dialogue open, and I'm so glad to have the president of the Duma here. And, but we... Of course, we disagree on the annexation of Crimea because it's violating international law. And then he said in his reply, well, uh, Crimea was a democratic process, not like the German state with its reunification. And if you hear such a sentence, you see how difficult it is to find common grounds to discuss about uh, de uh, democracy. Uh, well, 
I thanked a lot of people, uh, the, uh, the participants in, the, uh, in uh, our uh, uh, panel, but I also want to uh, congratulate the hackathon winner. And I see uh, young people here who participate. You all did a wonderful uh, job. Thank you very much for participating, and you deserve all our applause. And to the winner, you have a fantastic project. And that's an inspiration for us. And that's why our foundation really helps young people to develop in their countries ideas to give us insights and uh, to develop that. Because it's true, without democracy, nothing works. And we were talking now about investments, about business, about economy. Economy doesn't work with, uh, growth doesn't work uh, with, uh, without, um, uh, without democracy. And I want to refer to another experience I made. I was um, a rapporteur of the Council of Europe of the transition of Tunisia after the Arab Spring. And I went to Tunisia and the then president of Tunisia, Mr. Esepsi, he looked at me and he said, you know, before you can vote, you first have to be able to eat. And that was also a lesson I took. So we need to strengthen the economy also in the other parts of the world. Otherwise, democracy doesn't work, and the economy doesn't work without democracy. So it's important to do that. And another lesson I got through my experience is when we are in other countries, and I noticed that especially in Tunisia, where we worked quite well together, but unfortunately uh, there was a backslide uh, since then. That is that they, uh, the NGOs, at the beginning, they had the fear that we were patronizing them. And when I told them, well, it's your revolution, you did it, all we can do is help you to, to uh, to set in place what you, uh, what you need, but we are certainly not patronizing you. And that is also about the moral standards. We have to explain what are the goals of Europe, what are the goals of freedom of expression, what are those values we are defending without patron, uh, patronizing, otherwise uh, this is uh, not uh, accepted. Uh, allow me to make a quote from former UN Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali. While the broad principles of democracy are universal, the fact remains that their application varies considerably. We are at the beginning of the road at the very beginning. We still have a long way to go." End of quote. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, this road leads us for the moment in the wrong direction and we can see it worldwide and also, unfortunately, in uh, Europe. Not only uh, the horrible war of Putin's war in Ukraine, but also uh, the influence we have from outside coming. And it was report, uh, referred to this morning, the Slovakian uh, in, uh, uh, elections, which were based on disinformation, and that came uh, clearly from uh, from Slovakia. Another thing of disinformation, and it wasn't referred to, to uh, this uh, today, that is, and I was appalled when I read what uh, Musk said. Musk blamed the German government for helping NGOs who uh, rescue lives in the Mediterranean Sea. And then he said that in Germany, people should uh, vote for the extreme right AFD party. And so the disinformation not only comes from Russia or from China, or for, for, but also from the right, far right-winged uh, people uh, in, in, in the States. And Musk having one of the biggest instruments of uh, cyber influencing, and that also should uh, give us more than food. Uh, for, uh, for thoughts. So it's not a positive conclusion that I'm going to draw because here are only people who are convinced. And so I don't 
have to convince you, you don't have to convince uh, me, but what we have to do is to continue to fight for human rights, the rule of law and uh, the uh, democracy. And I want to uh, have another quote, uh, a quote uh, of um, Stefan Zweig, who wrote in 1932, we must be united, we have, of the ancient cultures, we must melt all our differences and jealousies in the passion for this greater goal of loyalty to our shared past and faith in our common future. That was in 1932. Have we learned the, uh, the lesson? We have to avoid to make the same error and not uh, to, uh, to react. So the challenges are huge, but I know there are a lot of people uh, who help to take up uh, that uh, challenge. And uh, that are, uh, is going to be my concluding remarks. Uh, but at the end, I would like to thank also our moderator. Melinda, you did a fantastic job. And uh, your, your knowledge is just fantastic and how you, you, uh, you did it. So uh, really res res respect and all my admi uh, admiration. So one last word. Um, we have hashtag reshape Europe. I think we first have to shape it. And that's our duty for today, tomorrow and after tomorrow. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank. <laughs>